before we start this evening, uh, this is a great Veterans Day. I just wonder, are there any veterans in the room who uh, serve our country? If there are, would you please stand and let us uh, recognize you today? Uh, or, if you, yeah, or if you have a child that's uh, serving as a veteran, or if you, uh, you're married to a veteran, if you would please stand also. Let's all stand and we'll uh, all join together in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Agenda. Mr. President, I move that the board approve the November 11, 2019 agenda. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any questions or other comments about the agenda? All right. Facebook a couple weeks ago to watch the Raytown Middle School uh, radio program that they did. Somebody had posted the live um, show airing of that. It was neat to hear the kids talk about, we talked about the hiring of the teachers and um, the effect of school shootings on our students and school safety. So it was really interesting to hear their <coughs> point of view through that. So I just um, thought that was neat. And then um, parent teacher conferences, thank you guys for all the extra hours that you put in over that week. As a parent, I know for me it's highly beneficial to go meet with Max's teachers and find out just where we need to crack down a little more, or a lot more, where <laughs> French is concerned. <laughs> and then um, on the 30th, I was able to go with uh, Dr. Bruton and our architects and meet with them about some of the um, projects for Raytown High and kind of hear how that process is going, so I'm just very thankful um, to get to be in there and see how everything works on that, so thank you for that, Sandy. Mr. President, um, last Thursday I had an opportunity to uh, go to the warm comfort uh, of uh, South High's auditorium and watch their play uh, 9 to 5, and it's amazing, it's tremendous, the talent that our high schools have, and then this weekend, uh, Raytown High uh, play is uh, the Adams family I think is going to be going on and then Friday night I had an opportunity to go to Raytown High School's open gym or football field and it was not warm but did see Raytown play a nice football game and they did one and we'll probably hear some more about that later but again uh, the talent that we have at our schools is tremendous <laughs> Um, I read in the um, in the uh, reports that um, the culinary students sold 206 quarts of soup with, last month, and I bought a few of them. They were excellent. They're great. So if you get a chance, do that next year. I didn't realize they were fundraising for their competition, so that's great. And then, you know, the Thanksgiving pies are on sale now, so... Those will be good. Um, on uh, November, or at, uh, last week, before things, before Halloween, at New Trails, I went to the Learnscape dedication, New Trails slash Blue Ridge, and that was really, it, it's just unbelievable. You just go drive by and see it. It's, it's just unbelievable. So thank you to Hollis Miller for the uh, beautiful addition. 
I, last Thursday I went to MSBA training. I see I made the, did you know? <laughs> I didn't realize it was that big of a thing, but it was, um, we, it's a required training that we'll be going to on uh, the board's role in preventing student sexual abuse. And even though the topic is not um, one that you want to talk about, the MSBA trainings are always good. They always start on time, they end on time, they have good information, they don't waste our time. And it was really, really good. And I too went to 9 to 5 last Friday and um, I kind of wondered how they were going to do some of that, you know, like with Mr. Hart when he was at, at the uh, at his home and I took my granddaughter and it, it was just great. <laughs> they did a good job. And it made me realize how many things have changed over the years, you know, like typewriters and and correction tape and just the whole attitude of people working in offices. It's something our kids <coughs> Those high school kids probably didn't know what sometimes they were talking about. <laughs> Those old things. So they did a good job. They really are talented. Um, about three weeks ago, I got to visit the transportation. I went to a uh, bus barn. Um, they didn't let me drive. <laughs> but, um, we would let you drive. <laughs> <laughs> They invited me to get my CDL at 5 in the morning, but uh, I've been trying ever since I got on the board, just been trying to meet with each department. I, I think I made uh, quite a few rounds so far. Uh, next, I plan to be uh, going to just individual schools and everything. But I'm really uh, excited about just to see what's actually going on. You know, it's a lot we take for granted in our district, and it's a lot of good people, a lot of hardworking people that's doing great jobs. Um, with uh, sometimes um, limited resources, and I and I really appreciate what's uh, what's going on. Oh, I'd also been meeting with Dr. Hux, and uh, he's letting me. Uh, I'm an engineer by profession. He's letting me uh, really get back into that, and it's been it's been fun. I've been enjoying it. So I'm gonna try not to take up too much space. I'm sure he's enjoying getting engineering advice without billing for it. <laughs> we all appreciate that. Anyone else? Right, I'll just mention a couple of things. I will mention I also attended 9 to 5, and we got some great talent at both of our high schools. Just fantastic job. And if I'm, I can't remember everything in the program, but if I'm not mistaken, Ms. Hoffman right here, you were the assistant director for the show, right? Yes, well, just sir. stand up and let us give you a hand for that. Oh. I didn't see that on the you know if that was a planned thing, but I saw you there, so recognize that. You guys did a great job. Uh, yeah, all the typewriters, I don't think they even had a typewriter to use as a prop. I think they were using some made-up thing as a typewriter. <laughs> But see if they would be able to find a typewriter though, somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and I was also at the at the ribbon cutting for the new trails uh, learnscape. And again, thank you to Hollis Miller. That was a great uh, great addition. I can't wait to uh, till it gets warm again and turn the water on so I can get out there and play in it myself because it just looks like a lot of fun. The rocks. It's going to be interesting with the big rocks out there. We'll see. I mean, we, we spent all this money to put turf underneath all our playgrounds, and then we put some big giant rocks in there. <laughs> but, but they'll have fun climbing. Kids are supposed to climb all the rocks. Uh, and uh, we also, I was at the Chamber of Commerce luncheon a couple of weeks ago where we had the uh, update, the district update, and uh, you guys, Dr. Shelton and Dr. Huff did a great job on that, so appreciate that. We had a lot of our students at the luncheon that day, too. And then I was at the uh, 90th uh, celebration of the Chamber's 90th anniversary, so that was a good good night. I'm glad that the district uh, was a support of the Chamber and the Chamber was a support of the district, so appreciate all that. And I don't see a, there's not a ref report tonight, is there? No. So since there's not a ref report, I'll just take this time to give a little publicity, we've talked about it before, 
and and I'll just do it right now by buying a couple of cards from Martha. Come up here. <laughs> Come on up here. I'll buy a couple. Okay, I'll and you take can, your money. You can, you can say something about about what this is. Okay. Yes, and um, there's a video. You my <laughs> he wants his cards. Oh, you want a card? I'll fill that out and give it to you later. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell what it is. I'll, I'll give you the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> the grocery grab, and if you go online to our um, website, Kim Snyder's put up a very fun video. Um, if, check your district email because Brad Frost made another appearance this evening. <laughs> She's getting turkey day ready. So just um, do that, and I will get you your cards after the meeting. And Thank when you. is that? Uh... And the, um, the semifinal is November 30th, and the actual grand prize grocery grab is December 7th. So if if I get picked and I get to do the thing, <laughs> can I have a proxy grabber for me? Or um, only if you're like have a huge cast. Yeah. Oh, so I can have Dr. Shelton do it. For yeah. Me. No, I don't think so. <laughs> All right. Okay. So buy those cards. Anything else? All right. Superintendent highlights. Well, just a few things. One, uh, I, I think that um, I'm trying to think back the last 12 years that I've ever had to drive roads in October to see if we would have school or not. But we have done that three times now, uh, which is a little scary. We've got a lot of winter to go. Uh, but still no snow days, Dante. We'll work on it. <laughs> Seeing him being a senior, he wants those snow days. Um, one of the things that you'll see here on the Did You Know, uh, I'm going to speak to you quickly, but we do have a state competition coming up for swim. Uh, so that's kind of personal because I am a freshman swimmer that's swimming in the state competition this week. So I want to follow him over there and watch him swim uh, a couple relays. So, but there's quite a few freshmen on that team. I think they've got some uh, some good years to come there. And lastly, just a thank you to everybody that's here. Um, if you didn't know, I went through kind of a health event about a month ago, a life-changing health event. And, but I w would say that the outpouring of support from the people in this room, in our town, and the people sitting up there <coughs> has been unbelievable. For my family, for me, uh, just goes to show you what such a great family we have here in Raytown. Uh, I made the decision to come here 12 years ago, and now I know why. Mm -hmm. I really do know why. So thank you for that, and that's all. All right. Thank you. We'll hear more uh, from Mark in a few minutes on his specific report items. All right, presentations and recognitions. All right. Also on Did You Know, uh, just once again, we want to thank all of the veterans for their service as we celebrate Veterans Day today um, and all the time. Um, and Ms. Tittle. We framed your certificate oh, for the training that you do. <laughs> it is a big deal. So going uh, specifically into the Raytown High Boys Swim Team, um, they earned conference titles and qualified to compete in state. Uh, every member of the varsity team medaled in at least one event. And it is the 44th year in a row that the Raytown High Swim Club has qualified for the state competition. Uh, Herndon Career Center students, they have a donation for REAP going on right now uh, throughout the month of November. They hope to raise $2,500 in cash and collect more than 2,000 non-perishable food items. Um, if you'd like to donate, you can visit Herndon Career Center Building A between the hours of 7 a.m. and 2 p.m. And um, if you donate five non-perishable food items or make a monetary donation, uh, you can receive 10% off of the services at the uh, HCC salon and <coughs> we have a 2016 graduate who currently attends the University of Kansas um, and is an architectural engineering major and he recently participated in something called the Global Grand Challenges um, Summit in London, England and he was a part of a team of students from around the world. They were given two days to develop a business plan and address an engineering challenge and he finished in the top four of 50 teams in the competition wow. and created an app 
um, which offers incentives to customers of large coffee companies um, to encourage recycling and help them um, have received sustainable resources. So that was awesome of an alumni participating on a national, international level and, and doing very well. And then um, <coughs> Town South High National Honor Society, they sponsor a school-wide blood drive through the Community Blood Center. More than 90 students and staff participated and gave more than 62 units of blood. Each unit of blood has the potential to save three lives. So, uh, and Raytown South High Secretary Janessa Taylor, she became an official gallon donator at the blood drive. We won't talk anymore about that. That's an amazing accomplishment. I don't know what gallon of blood looks like. Um, that's really, really awesome. Really, really great. Um, a really, really great fundraiser. So, with us tonight, we have the technology repair team. So, I'll invite them to come up. And our technology repair team for the third year in a row, they've received the Outstanding Service Award from Lenovo. Um, it's given to the top 10% of repair shops in the United States for their accuracy of repairs and timeliness and repair completion. Um, our technology repair team, repair team supports more than 10,000 devices around the district. And during the 18-19 school year, they repaired close to 2,000 parts in the devices. So I'll invite Anita, who is the repair coordinator, to come up and then introduce the rest of the team. Um, well, good evening, and um, Danielle told us a lot of what we uh, what we do here, but I do want Linda to come up and introduce herself and let, her, let you guys know what <coughs> Yeah, there really are more, more of us. We don't have those 1900 <laughs> Yeah, so this is Linda Kelly, and she's one of 11, uh, one of the frontline techs that are out there actually uh, in the front lines uh, doing repairs. And like um, Danielle said, we've done over 1900 parts repairs uh, over the last year, and that's with uh, 10 other people who actually helped us with that. So um, with that, Lenovo Award means is that we actually um, were able to, when we when we warranty our parts, so when we send them in, we know that what that part is we send in is actually what the problem is with the computer. So in that way, we don't get the cost back to the district um, because we sent in a part that was not correct. And so when they take that part back in, they look at it, they know that this part was the bad part. So that's what gives us the highest, the higher number of what, uh, of our repairs, uh, of giving that, getting that re reward for that. And also our self-maintainer is that we actually are out in the buildings, we are uh, making sure we are repairing kiddos, computers, and teachers. We try to commit to a 24-hour time timeline to turn those around. And so we have repair parts we go out in the field with and they repair those computers right on the spot so they can get those computers right back in the kids' hands uh, as soon as possible. So uh, that's working really, really well for us by uh, having that out there. And uh, and um, I really do appreciate, like I said, I wish the other ones were here, other 11. Um, uh, working with them is really great and they're, you know, always just really, really ready to help the kiddos and help them to do what's you know necessary for that technology to work to, to make them successful. And um, uh, we have some other, Kevin's back there, uh, Prosser, Kevin, if you stand up, he actually does some repairs too, but he's uh, helping out. Uh, Melissa Tevin Camp, she's back there. And Matt Verlinden, uh, some other faces that you, or names that you probably hear in technology, we're all in this together, so. You know, we really, really love uh, making sure that your technology, and even as teachers and staff members and board members that have computers, and when they have problems, they come through there to us. And we every principal out <laughs> <laughs> We try to get those back out to you. So we really do appreciate your, your recognition. Thank you. Thank you.
Also here with us this evening, we have Raytown High School defensive back Dante Manning. He was selected to play the Under Armour All-America football team. Only 100 of the top high school student players are selected to play um, on the team and compete and learn from the best coaches in the game. He has a game coming in January um, in Orlando, Florida. And um, I'm going to invite Dante and Coach to come up. But also on Friday, <coughs> Raytown High School defeated Chrisman. Um, and we'll play in the Class 5, District 7 championships this coming Friday at Fort Osage High School. They are also up to be the KCTV 5 uh, Team of the Week. And so we encourage everyone to vote for Raytown High versus uh, Fort Osage. Um, and the voting for that ends at 1 p.m. on Wednesday. We probably better not let Dante talk or you guys will be here a lot longer than you want. <laughs> um, obviously, um, Dante's a great athlete, um, great football player. The thing I love about Dante is uh, he's an even better young man. Um, I think anytime you talk to any teacher, any custodian, anybody at Raytown High School, you ask them about Dante Manning, they're going to light up, they're going to smile immediately. Um, so anytime you can package that with, you know, having a According to ESPN, the top five defensive back in the nation. I mean, that makes me a really good coach. So he got that opportunity to play in that game. What I was really excited about, they emailed me last month and they also fly out all the head coaches of the players, so I will be going to Orlando also. Uh, But obviously Dante's been a three-year starter for us since I've got here. He's been a huge part, uh, you know, of kind of the turnaround we're working on here. Um, this will be the second year winning season. Uh, we were doing some research. This is the first time back-to-back -back winning season since 88. Uh, so it's been a long time for that. Um, and I know our last district championship, which we'll be competing for Friday, was 1989. Um, so if we can get that done, we're really looking to go forward with that. Um, but like I said, Dante's just been a huge part of that. We're proud of him. Um, he uh, also um, will be getting you know, his college education paid for through uh, some football scholarships. I've been telling him we're a package deal. <laughs> <laughs> who, uh, who, is, who is our top five down to now? <laughs> so we're still looking at uh, Oklahoma, Oregon, uh, Arizona State. A&M and uh, Georgia. Well, obviously those are Georgia. Five of those, four of those teams are in the top ten in the nation football-wise. So uh, we're really excited for wherever he goes. Uh, go to Georgia. But <laughs> not that I'm pushing that. Uh, my best friend from high school is a defensive coordinator at Georgia, so I may have a little bias there. But uh, I'll be excited wherever we go or wherever we go again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have much to say. Like, um, I want to say thank you to the coaches um, for getting me to this point. Um, all the people that surrounded me, Dr. Martha, for you know being in my ear all the time. So I just want to say thank you for everybody. Oh, and especially my mom. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and introduce her? Yeah. Oh, this is my mom, uh, Yolanda Nickens. Uh, without her, I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> 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 so, Dante, what's your favorite subject in school? Uh, wait. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. What's your favorite subject in school? <laughs> I'll probably say all right, graphic design. All right. Yeah. And since uh, coming up in May, there will be a document that you'll be getting, your graduate or graduation diploma that will have my signature on it, then I'll probably need your autograph at some point. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we'll work it on that. <laughs> Last up, we have uh, Amy Sadler and Brandon Ford. 
Uh, on October 8th, Raytown High and Raytown South High orchestra students had a very unique and really incredible opportunity to learn from Bluegrass and Western Swing Performance Group, Kyle Dillingham and Horseshoe Road, in a collaboration um, made in part by the, the two teachers and uh, teaching and learning a grant from the Educational Foundation. They had uh, an all-day workshop during the day and then had the opportunity to perform a concert that evening at Raytown High School. So we just want to recognize uh, Amy and Brandon and have them come up and talk a little bit about um, the process that they went through and the experience our students had. Uh, good evening. Uh, it was uh, with something we've been wanting to do for a while was to collaborate together as uh, orchestras from across the district. You know, you hear a lot of rivals from uh, Raytown, Raytown South. We wanted to do something that would really bring us all together. And uh, to be able to uh, bring a group in that had traveled. And, uh, I mean, the main member had been over 42 countries, uh, the group themselves, and to be able to bring them in and work with our kids to uh, really uh, to teach them about how music inspires and how it heals and how we can work together to uh, to do great things with that. Uh, I, I wanted to thank the board for allowing this opportunity to happen uh, because it was a really great experience for, for the kids, it was a great experience for us, and uh, if you were there, I'm sure you're, uh, it was a great experience for you too. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bridget, for, uh, for allowing us to, to, for hosting us as well, so that was really great. So. Um, one of the things that uh, I think the kids got out of it, it freaked them out at first when we were, they were working with Kyle and the musicians was they were starting to learn a piece of music and the students had prepared most of the songs that they were learning, but one of the pieces they didn't know and there was no music in front of them. There were just some numbers and like some chord numbers and the kids were like, we can't play this, we don't have music in front of us. And, so they went through a lot of chord progression and changes and they kind of taught them to play it by ear and ad lib and add rhythms and add boings as they felt they needed to. And so and they performed a piece that night with no music in front of them, just uh, some chord charts. And that's something that string players don't usually do. We don't make up things on the spot. We want every note right now. <laughs> and, uh, and then one of the other really more meaningful things the kids got out of it was that they brought a huge box of broken pieces of instruments. Um, and they had each kid come up and get an instrument and come up with some kind of sound it made. And they had a couple instruments themselves that were broken but still made, they got them to make a sound. And they played a song called, um, what was the title of that song, you remember? Uh, Grace of God with the Broken Instruments. About how music, even with broken instruments, they can still make music and they can still create a sound. Even if it's not the most perfect sound, but they... And so the kids got to do some ad lib with that, making the different sounds on their instruments, even though they weren't the normal sounds that the fixed, perfect instruments make. And how we can, how we can find beauty in a broken world as well, so you can create that uh, for a live lesson too. Wow. So, That's nice. That's good. so thank you, board. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys for making that happen. Uh, I'm not uh, bashful in saying that I appreciate this board, that we, we do support the arts strongly in this district just as much as we do our <coughs> athletic programs and the other programs. So it's very important we appreciate that work. So thank you. We didn't have anyone sign up to speak on the agenda items, but is there anyone that wanted to speak to any agenda items that may have not, not got to sign in? All right. Dr. Mark. Okay. Just a couple things. I want to save the time for our uh, APR report and a few other things. But uh, the first item you see uh, in the legislative update, other than the fact that we do have two legislative forums coming, uh, December the 6th will be the first one. It, it will be at 9 a.m. That's a Friday at the Raytown School Wellness Center. And also February the 7th, uh, which is another Friday at 9 a.m. Uh, we'll have our le local legislators in to discuss things that are going on in Jefferson City. At that time, uh, if you scroll on down to 8.7, uh, you notice that the elementary schools again knocked it out of the park on parent-teacher conferences at 97% uh, attendance rate of parents, which is, is fantastic. Um, 
also, if you scroll on down there, you see the Cerner First Hand Foundation of 8.10. Uh, in case you didn't know, that is Cerner. We partnered with Cerner to provide one social worker uh, at their cost, uh, provide free for the district, and that social worker is working at Central Middle School and Raytown Middle School. And then on the Grant Rider Report, which you'll also see an agenda item in new business for the uh, purchase of facial recognition software, uh, just, to, just to remind everyone that uh, remember when we hired a uh, grant writer a few months ago to start exploring some of these grants, we netted a $250,000 Department of Justice grant uh, that will be used to pay for that um, facial recognition software. So we're excited about that. And with that being said, are there any questions on those? And working on down to 8.9, I'm going to let uh, Travis mention any of the uh, items or questions you might have on the bond project chain orders. We always have a few. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions. If you open the uh, change order report, uh, there's a couple lines in there that are blue. <coughs> This time, that's an insurance claim. You may recall in the summertime when the three trails was flooded due to some uh, roofing issues that they were working on. So uh, we're working with the contractor and their insurance company for reimbursement on that. We had the contractor, Bruner, who was already there doing renovations, do that work so we could still get it done on time. But uh, at the end of the day, we shouldn't net out at no cost to us after uh, insurance is completed. So, does anybody have any questions? I'm sorry, uh, Travis. The sheet that we're looking at. It, uh, it'll be like an Excel document. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these are the contingencies that we have paid out. I'm understanding that correctly. Correct, yes. So when we have contingencies, it's because the cost is exceeded. We initially had a certain dollar amount that we'd be paying for something, but it exceeded that, right? Uh, yes, like if something unexpected comes up in the project that's not in the base bid that we have to take care of. So if we open up a wall and we find that there's asbestos that needs to be removed, we're anticipating that. We have to hire a company to come remove that asbestos. This is probably a question you may not have the answer for, but of the number that we're looking at here, how many projects are, uh, let me see if I can get my question right here, total number of projects that this is reflective of? Not, not this list, I'm just saying how many projects, not all of our projects required a contingency, did they? I mean, not nothing, but let me reword it. Not all of our projects we paid a contingency on, right? Correct, yes. So of this number of contingency projects that we did pay contingencies on, what is that number uh, uh, subtracted from? How many projects? Um, uh, this accounts for about six projects. Now within those projects, give you an example, roofs. Roofs are at seven locations um, for the 2019 building upgrades. That's also at seven locations, even though that's considered one project. So, so perhaps I think I, I think sorry. I understand the question. Every project has a contingency. Right. We haven't spent that money. That's the amount of the contingency in the original contract. So this is not money that we have spent. Not in that sure. column. Travis, can you explain what we discussed about the uh, percentages completion? Sure. I think that might help. Sure, and I've, I've been adding to this document to try to make it more informative as we go. Um, but in, <coughs> which might make it too complicated. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, but anyway, <coughs> we've been uh, adding a completion percentage to the projects, like where are we at with its uh, completion. And for all of our projects, we're 84% complete. Okay, so we have 16% left of all the work to do. But if you go and look in the column <coughs> with contingency remaining, we have 66.18% of our contingency remaining. So our, our we're, we're doing good 
in my estimation, having 16% of the project remaining, 66% of the contingency remaining. So I don't know if that answered the question or the part that you were asking or not. I was hoping that would. Well, that actually, that actually sounds high to me. We, we, we usually budget a 10% contingency in each of these contracts. Correct. So and we're we have saying 66 percent of those 10 percent contingencies still available to us. So we don't always uh, utilize that contingency. We have it there, but we don't always utilize. Correct. It. Some projects are. Uh, give you an example at Blue Ridge. Uh, we've had two large uses of contingency because of the parapet that runs around that building that was built in 1949. Um, you know, the bricks are literally falling off the wall as if you're from Blue Ridge as you are you, you know what I'm talking about we had to repair that um, and we see that when we begin to pull the roof back we realize you can scratch the grout out of your finger uh, that's not ideal so we had to repair those those are unforeseen but necessary due to the age of the building so that Blue Ridge roofing project we use the contingency um, if you go to the uh, you know let's say the the 2019 building upgrades, which was at seven locations, um, you know, we didn't use much of that at all. We didn't have to change order for that project. So you just never know what you're going to run into. So we always plan for a 10% contingency. And then I have one more question. Was it what is the insurance claim? What explain that to me? What is that? <clears throat> you bet. So we were renovating three trails this summer, and while one country contractor was renovating three trails there was also a roofing contractor roofing the building they didn't uh, secure the roof we had a I don't know, seven inch rain that weekend and flooded three trails and run a lot of work we just had completed so we filed an insurance claim with both our insurance company and the roofing contractor their insurance and because we had a contractor there already doing the renovations and we needed to get that work done before school started, we had this, the contractor go back and fix all the stuff that was messed up from the flood. And we charged that to the roofing company at this time and we're working through uh, getting paid for that. Thank you. But you said we filed a claim with our insurance company? We have, but we're. You know, it's all about claims experience, so if we can keep it off our insurance and put it on theirs, that's better for us, because at... Why would there even be a question about that? Well, there's not, but, you know, will the contractor want to uh, fulfill that obligation? Those are pieces you have to work through. So. Let me ask you one other quick question about the stage wall, even though it's been done for a while. Was there anything that needed to be done or corrected as a result of the contractor's work out there that maybe that they had let weather get in. I mean, I know it was complicated and stuff, but was there anything added that they needed to do that was not maybe should have been we should have been charged for that would have been a result of their no their doing no. And if you remember, uh, I'm not sure if you ever were out there on site, but when they took down the south wall and exposed that south wall, they actually uh, encased the work area with uh, screens and. Um, that's what's the word I mean. scaffolding and, and screening to get that weatherproofed in uh, during their work so that we wouldn't have damage to like the stage and things like that. Yep. Any other questions on that one? Uh, before we turn it over to Dr. Huff, uh, go over the APR, I think we probably we have a special guest in the crowd tonight, a blast from the past, so to speak. Uh, someone who worked here for 10 years, and we'll embarrass her a little bit and introduce her, but she needs no introduction. That's Dr. Janie Pyle, there in the back. So. Good evening, everybody. Uh, poor Tara, as Travis is going there talking about the summer uh, rainfall they had inside the building, she's over twitching. <laughs> Bringing back bad memories. Uh, I want to thank the crowd for coming today. Um, as we go through this presentation, this is definitely a group effort. And Curriculum Instruction has a large team. And we brought a large part of that team, not everybody obviously, uh, but all the principals, 
uh, some coordinators, some directors that do a lot of hard work to make sure that we provide the very best instruction possible for every single one of our kids every single day. And I want to thank every one of you for coming out today. And you know, I think we have a very proud, proud moment today in talking about some of the great things that are going on. And, and also, in recognition of Dr. Pyle, a lot of what we're going to talk about today are things that she put in place when she was here. And so she also deserves a lot of credit for what we're going to talk about today as well. So we have a lot of slides to cover today. This is less a presentation than it is a discussion. And if at any moment you are not following what I have to say, please stop. We'll make sure to reset to where you need to be so that we can you know, have a good discussion with everything going on today. Curriculum instruction is a complex business. And so we have a lot of slides, a lot of numbers, uh, but certainly not everything. And we don't want this discussion to go on for, for maybe you do want to talk for hours about curriculum instruction. We certainly would love it. Uh, but we're going to try and keep it to a reasonable amount. But that doesn't mean we talk about everything. Please ask questions as we go if there are things or gaps that you'd like to discuss. Before I open it up too much further here, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the APR process. Know that the APR process is different this year, and actually DESI has changed it substantially almost every year for the last several years. This year, the APR was not released by the DESI at all. And so normally we get a number, right? We talk about the, the 82 or the 75 or the whatever number it would be, the percent that we got on the APR. That was not released by DESI. It was not calculated at all. And so we don't have, none of the districts have a number from DESI as to what the APR is. So I won't actually be sharing what the APR number is. DESI actually released a new way of presenting the APR. And quite honestly, we felt we're only going to be seeing this APR for a couple years because MSIP 5 is going to turn into MSIP 6. We want to present something to you all that is very familiar, that tells the story of what APR is without tr uh, trying to new learn a whole new lexicon of what uh, the APR reports to the state as a whole. And so we'll stick with what we've done before and believe me, it reports all the numbers and I'll share that with you as we go through here. That is reported on the APR as well. And so as we go through and talk about the APR, I'll try these graphs, I'll try and relate it back to this is how the APR is, is calculated. The APR looks at several different measures for us. It looks at our academic performance, and it also looks at what are called college and career readiness standards. So what are our graduates looking like? Um, are we doing well on, on tests and assessments as they leave us? Are they doing well in college? Are they coming every day? Are we graduating them properly? And as well as the, the performance on maps and EOCs, math, ELA, science, social studies. All right, and so the first part of the presentation is gonna be about going over those academic measures, and then we'll follow that up with those college and career readiness measures. All right, so we'll see how this goes. Look at that. All right, so the first slide here, uh, just giving you a little bit of history as to where we are and how we've gotten here. And so the MSIP 5 has been around for a few years, and I think back to 2014, we had MAPS, uh, MAP was the GLEES, the grade level expectations of the old standards. And then those changed around, we got to 2015 through 17, we had the Common Core State Standards, you may remember those. Lovely, they're still hanging around. Um, and we did that for a bit, and we had a couple vendors that did that with us. Uh, not all grade levels took the performance events and the writing prompts with the DRC. But then you remember that the state had a little bit of an issue with Common Core, right? And so the state legislature came in, changed us from Common Core to saying we are really prevented from talking about Common Core at all. And so in 2017, the law required us to teach using the new Missouri Learning Standards and the test was still based on the Common Core. And so we were teaching one set of standards and being assessed on a separate set of standards. 2018, we had the new Missouri Standards and, and Missouri Assessments. And so, in summary, we had four separate or different item pools, plus three sets of standards, plus five years of data equals chaos. And so this has been a rough time for several years because we had no continuity. Now the good thing is, we're now on track. We have some continuity, and I'll show you a slide that's coming up next. I'll show what that continuity is. But we only have one more year at MSIP 5. We're going to roll into the new version of MSIP 6. Right now they're going through uh, the standardization process, setting metrics for MSIP 6. And so we'll know a lot more about it at the end of this year, 
we're going to transition into it to where we're actually going to have a full-fledged MSIP 6 in a couple of years. Next year, we'll probably have MSIP 5 and, and MSIP 6 scores together. And so this will be a much more complicated discussion a year from now. And then after that, we'll be fully-fledged into MSIP 6. And we'll be able to talk a, little bit, a lot more about it at that time, obviously. All right. So graphically, here's what it looks like. The blue, or purple, or whatever that color is, uh, shows assessments that are aligned to new expectations. So we have expectations and standards, or and uh, standards and expectations and assessments that match. And so if you look back 2017-18, ELA and math were all together. We are doing a science field test that year. 2018-19, we had the ELA, math, and science test and standards that all matched. That was just last year. And last year we took the social studies field test. So 2019-20, where we are now, is the first year that we have all the standards in place and all the proper assessments matching those standards in place for a long time. And it has been a road trying to keep up with this ever-changing pace about what assessment is there, launching into assessment with teachers along with the Missouri Learning Standards. We're on a good pace right now. And we do not, don't expect there to be major changes coming up. There will be small tweaks along the road, but that's typical and expected. All right, any questions about that portion, about our history? Okay. We're going to go through and do several graphs that look a lot like this. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about just what's all on this graph and so they can all make sense as we move forward. We've got 2015 through, eight, through 2019 data here. And these are our MAP and EOC scores. And so obviously, District 3rd grade ELA, this is a MAP test. We, the numbers that are, that are up there are called MPI. And MPI is a combination of all levels of you know, what students got on the test. And so we get a certain score for students that got below basic and basic. And as you move on up to advanced, proficient, then you get a higher score. And so the higher the number, the more students you have in advanced and proficient. The lower the number, the more students you have in, in basic and below basic. As you move students up the scale, move students from below basic to basic and on up, you get a higher score, obviously. And so this is a good summary score about where our students land. So what we have are two lines here. One is the state which is the red, one is the district, which is the blue. We use this district, the state, as a comparison because as you'll see in these graphs, the, the, the test widely varies from year to year. In essence, the test gets harder or easier from year to year. And so if you just look at us, it might look like we are going down and we actually are not going down. The test just got harder. It also might look like we've gone up and we actually did not go up. And so the way I want you to look at this graph is to be looking at the distance between us and the state. We want to see that distance shrink. If the distance is shrinking, we've improved from one year over the next. Even if you're seeing us go down, if the state is going down as well, we didn't go down quite as much, that's an improvement. It means that we did better on a harder test than the rest of the state did. Okay. Does that make sense? All right, so there are three levels, three places that the APR gives us points, in essence, when we talk about the test. One is status, and that is just sheer number about what you got on the, on, on the MPI. And that number gets better the higher up in these levels you go. So you'll notice on the left, we have target, or the 2020 target, which is what it used to be called, on track, approaching, and floor. The higher up on those levels you are, the more points you're going to get, raw points for that particular area. And so the state wants us to be obviously in the target range. Nice being now on track, approaching is okay, we certainly don't want to be in the floor. Okay? So that's stats. The state also gives us points for growth. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll talk about uh, progress first. Progress is year over year change. And we want to be seeing a graph that looks more like this. If you see a graph that's sloping up, then that means you're progressing from year to year with your students, and that's a programmatic discussion. Are our students overall doing better from one year to the next? And it does, it's irrelevant of who's in the pool, because obviously the pool changes from year to year. A bunch of students drop off, don't take the test. A bunch of new students come in and take the test. 
The last is growth. Growth is a student's growth from year to year. So an individual student taking a test in third grade compared to fourth grade, compared to fifth grade, and on up. So on these graphs, although I won't stop and really talk about it, you can do that and see what our individual students did by looking at the cohorts. And so for instance, if I look at third grade in 2016, these kids will be fourth graders in 2017. They'll be fifth graders in 2018. And so if you, if you shuffle through the graphs, you can see how a cohort does from graph to graph as you move across. And that's, in essence, growth, although growth is looking at individual student level. You get a pretty good idea by looking at cohort. Okay? All right, so I'm going to go through these graphs fairly fast. So please stop me if you have any questions along the way. Are we okay with what's on the graph? There's going to be a bunch of them like this. We're going to go first through ELA. We're going to go through all the grade levels. And third grade ELA is a good example of one that uh, we did decently this last year. I'd say that we just stayed low. We, we hung with the state, although I would like to see us get back to where we were in 2017. I mean, that, would be, that was a nice year for us, and that certainly shows where we can be. Uh, fourth grade, we actually saw a little bit of a drift uh, from where we were in 2018. So we had a good score in 2018 and 2016. A little bit of a drift away uh, from where we were in fourth grade. Fifth grade, though, I, if, I, I couldn't pick out a much better shape of graph, right? Nice, level, increase, all the way. And the state actually had the decrease for the last couple of years. We closed the gap. And this past year in fifth grade, we were closer to the state than any other point in the last five years. That's a nice graph. We'd like them all to look that way. Sixth grade, we've been drifting for a couple of years, and then we're a little bit further away than we'd like there. Seventh grade, same. Eighth grade, though, looks a little bit like fifth grade, doesn't it? We, we made some nice little gains, and actually we are closer in 2019 than we have been in the past five years in eighth grade. So eighth grade looks really nice for us. Uh, District uh, English 2, notice there's a gap there. That gap is the year that we that the state invalidated the results of the test. They said that those test results were not worth even looking at, and so we didn't get those results. But if you look at how close we are in 2018, again, we're as close as we've ever been. And English 2 did a very nice job. So looking at District ELA as a whole, we actually did not move whatsoever from last year. We stayed stable. And it's okay news. If we look at all the past five years, the only year really that was better than this year was 2016. We're a little bit closer to the state in 2016. Obviously, we'd like to still close that gap. Um, but it's also not too bad to not drift away from them either. So, any questions on ELA here? Question. Yes, sir. So, the uh, third grade slide, could you go back to that just a second? So the trend line is downward. Is that a predictor then for the fourth grade? So let's take a look and at then secondly, And then secondly, what are the characteristics of, the third, of our third grade that puts us uh, so significantly below the state level? Okay. So that's the first question first. Um, a way to look at that, you know, predictor, there is somewhat a predictor. Sometimes the cohorts themselves do tend to do better or worse. Uh, the sample size of our kids, about 600 kids taking the test each year. That's not a small sample size. Now compared to the state, it is small. And so you will see variability just based on the certain students that are in each cohort. And, and talk to any teacher who's ever taught. Um, they will talk about this year being a good crop of kids and the next year maybe being a little more challenging. That does happen. You do have certain students that, that sometimes they just have a feeling in a class. So what we can take a look at here, uh, as, a, as a for instance, we can look at 2018 and see how far they were from the state there, and then we can go to grade four and see what 2019 looks like. And they actually closed the gap a little bit there, from 2018 to 2019. And so what I'd say, which, you know, even though we drift a little bit from the state as a fourth grade, that cohort actually closed the gap a little bit from where they were in 2018. Now you asked the question about 
what kind of characteristics make up the third grade that maybe had them perform it the way they did? Um, I will say that I, that I struggle to, to answer a question like that in a simplistic manner because it is a very complicated question. And that is why we have, and you'll see in all these slides, we, we meet as DRTs, data review teams, to talk about where our students are at. And so all of these folks out here will meet, well not all, you don't have a lot of third graders, but the elementary folks are going to meet with their third grade teams. They meet with them for the most part every week, for the most part every Tuesday. And they look at individual students and see, okay, where are they at? How are they doing? And obviously this is the fourth grade that they'd be looking at for this, this group, because this group is now fourth grade. But in every grade, they're looking at why are they, why are they where they're at? What teaching strategies are effective? What teaching strategies maybe are not effective? What do we need to go back and reteach? Uh, what are we, maybe some behavior issues that we have in the class? Very complex issue, but that's where our DRTs come into focus. They take this data, which is this kind of metadata, and hone in on a very specific aspect of it to try to answer that question on a student by student level. So I hope that answers your question. Well, yeah, I mean, I understand what we do, but is that a significant difference in your mind? Is, the third, is, that, is that difference between the red line and the blue line a significant difference or nothing to worry about? No, it is significant. It is significant. And I would like to see it close. Yes. And so. And, and you'll see in our goals that, that we do wish for it to be close. Uh, to, to close it back down. We feel that we should be closer to where the state average is, and we work very hard to get there. And, and like I said, you'll see in the goals as I show after these slides, we are working hard in several areas specifically to get us there. I, I, I would hasten to say that probably everybody in this audience would agree that they are, as they look at their individual building data, and teachers look at their individual building data, we are rarely satisfied with where we're at. We strive to be better because the stakes are incredibly high. And especially the stakes when we talk about ELA and the reading and writing capabilities. We're talking about life-changing skills. What we do is life-changing, and we view it that way. So it is, it is important to us. And we want the gap to be gone. Is that state average a real average of all the districts? Yes. It's this a true yes. average. Yes. The only students that are not included in this are students that have been in the district less than a year. So when we have students that come in after the September count, they're not on here. And neither are they on the state. Or the or state. The state. Okay. Right. They'd be in their building for a year. That's that's it though. Okay. This one. And that's uh, the state average. That's the goal. No, it's, it's, it's a reference point. And so for us it's a goal because, as you'll see in the graphs, we tend to be below it. And so that is a goal to get to. If you're asking the state what the goal is, the state goal would be the 2020 target, that upper line would, would be the goal to get to. But you know what? Our goal is to be better next year than we are this year. It, no matter where we're at. We're never satisfied, we're never done. Yeah, I mean just, I know there's, like you said, it's complicated. Well, what, what would you think was a major reason why we're below? So let me, let me, to answer that, let me go to this next slide here. In, in talking about our goals, it also references where I, collectively, I say I, where we believe we need to focus because obviously it references places where we think we could improve. Uh, the first one you'll find on every single one of these areas, and that is in essence, working hard on our curriculum. And so you'll notice I use some language here, having clear, rigorous, unified instruction with guaranteed and viable curriculum. Those are not just haphazard terms. We are working really hard so that the message of what we should be teaching is in the hands of teachers so they know exactly what they should be teaching. And so matching the Missouri Learning Standards uh, with what goes on in the classroom every day. The last two words, guaranteed and viable curriculum, are actually terms that come out of Marzano. And it's what constitutes a great school. Guaranteed meaning that that curriculum is available to every student who walks through those doors. And that availability is a pretty broad term. And so that availability may be that it's on the level they need it to on. It may be that uh, you know, their behavior maybe gets in the way and, and we're making sure that they're in the classroom when they need to be. 
Guaranteed means a lot of things, but it means that it's there for every kid. Viable means it's just realistic. Because you can set high and lofty goals, but there's no way you can actually teach all that through the year. And so we parse that curriculum out to make sure that we can get to every single standard all the way through the year by prioritizing those standards. So it's one thing, you could just roll out the Missouri Learning Standards and say, teachers, teach the Missouri Learning Standards. There is so much on there that it would take years to get a year's worth of instruction in. That's one of the fallacies, actually, with what the, the state rolls out at us, at every state. It, it's impossible to teach all of everything that they roll out to you. So you prioritize what's important, and we focus in on those things. So that's the viable part of the curriculum. Uh, just a question on the graphs again. So when the score is lower for both us and the state, that's a harder test. Yeah, in essence, that's a simple way. So to say. it's not necessarily meaning that we got worse. It just meant uh, harder. So is the harder test determined by the fact that the scores are lower, or is it they actually know? Hey, next year I'm gonna give a harder test. Okay. Um, no, they actually do a really. They work really hard to try to make sure this doesn't happen, and it really shouldn't happen. And so when you look at a test that is that has really been worked properly like say the ACT, all right? If you look at the state and their average ACT score, it's a dead flat line. Now, it, it hasn't been for the last few years for a few reasons because we did statewide testing with all the juniors, all kinds of stuff. But before that, it did change for, I don't know, 15 years, like to the tenth of a point. Dead straight line. But yet, when you look at those same kids taking the state test, we're all over the place. Now, did those kids just get a lot more consistent when we got to the ACT, or is the test itself somewhat different from year to year? And in some cases, especially when you look at uh, biology has been the one historically that is just all over the place. Wide variations from year to year. It's just a different test. They do try not to do that. I, and, and really, some of our folks in the, in the audience here have been part of that process of writing and evaluating questions and trying to standardize that test. For instance, we did the whole social studies test, we field tested all those items last year. That whole, the reason for field testing is to try to make sure that we standardize that process. Every year, there are items thrown in that are field testing items. So we can try to, you know, test drive the item first, that kind of thing. But it just, it hasn't happened yet with the state. We're still widely variable from year to year. And they don't do that on purpose, it, it has been happening. So, standardizing the test actually would make the line flat. Should it? For the state, so, because actually, the sample yeah, size is large enough, it should be, it should be level. Yeah. But it's not. And so that's the world we live in, which is why we reference the state, because it does show the wide variability in the test. One other question. Um, so you talked about curriculum. Yes. You talked about continuous improvement. You talked about working hard. What, what, what else? What other external factors um, could we bring to bear here? For example, we talked about class size. We talk, we've talked about year-round school. Would that move the data in, in the direction of the state, up to the state <coughs> level? So let me talk about these goals first. I'll go through these, and then I'll come back to your question. Hopefully I've answered it through these two okay. slides okay. with our, our focus areas. That's fair. Uh, the second part of what on here is that beyond curriculum, like I said, the curriculum one is on all the slides. We're working hard on that across the board. Uh, provide uh, guidelines and professional learning opportunities for non-ELA teachers in the areas of nonfiction writing, uh, reading comprehensive uh, comprehension and argumentative writing. So that's social studies, math, science, art. We, the way to get to be a better reader is to read all the time. All right? And so we want our kids reading all the time. And we've provided tools and professional development for students to be reading and writing constantly. And that's actually one of our big curriculum and instruction goals. Reading and writing across all areas, all the time. We don't, and so to translate this into an answer for your question, we don't believe we're reading and writing enough. And so our goal is to make sure that we are expanding the amount that we are reading and writing. Okay. The third one there, provide students the opportunity to orally explain or defend their position using text evidence. And have development and appropriate discussions or argument of topics across the content areas. Uh, and actually an extension of this goal would be to, to figure out how to argue appropriately because, or debate appropriately, because the adults in our country are not modeling that well. Uh, we want them to be able to disagree and still get along. 
to disagree and listen and maybe change your position. This is a very important part of what we do. Identify and supply quality nonfiction writing samples in the highest interest reading materials to all levels, so to make the curriculum and objectives. Again, another reading one. Leverage use of reading specialists. We have reading specialists at all the elementary and middle schools. They are pulling students that are struggling readers. And they are providing very specific individualized and small group instruction for those students to try to scaffold them up to be better readers. And we are finding that to be quite effective. They are, they are talented professionals and are doing a nice job. Uh, use of multiple assessment tools to identify specific reading deficits and markers for dyslexia. You may remember that dyslexia identification is a state law and we are providing quite a bit of direction in that, in that means. We have a partnership with Kansas City Writing Project. We've had a partnership for, with the secondary for quite some time. We are starting to develop a, a relationship at the elementary level as well to uh, implement the 6 plus 1 trait writing. And 6 plus 1 trait writing is just a very simple way of looking at what quality writing is because we're going to have argumentative writing across the curricular areas. It would be nice for everybody to have a good idea about what qu good quality writing looks like. And 6 plus 1 tra uh, trait writing gives us that direction. Uh, classroom visits with, with visits with specific feedback. Our principals are doing that. Uh, our assistant associate superintendents are doing that. Our curriculum coordinators are doing that. We're getting in classrooms a lot and providing specific feedback on what good instruction is like. Data review teams. Uh, obviously, that's also in all of our areas, as well as uh, July Summer Learning Academy. And so you'd asked about extended school year, that sort of thing. We do believe that we see um, some good results out of the July Summer Learning Academy. I didn't put that on here, but we also see good results out of our June uh, summer school. Uh, but we also want to try to make that more academically focused as we move forward. <coughs> you asked about decreasing class sizes. And, and I'll say that uh, there's some mixed research on that specifically. Um, just decreasing class sizes is not effective. Decreasing class sizes <coughs> along with providing quality instruction is effective. We will start with providing quality instruction. And because we know we can do that right now. And the other part of it is reducing class sizes has to be done rather significantly to actually see significant impact. So what, we're, what we have here is lined out as research best practices. And so we look at Robert Mazzano, we look at um, John Hattie, giving us great direction in what uh, good quality changes are, these, these effective changes for us. All right, so that's ELA. Any, any, question, any more questions in ELA? So math looks very much the same. Okay, we're going to look at the same sort of graphs. Um, third grade, unfortunately, does not look at all like what we would like it to look like. We, we were looking great in 2014. We are about as far away in 2018 as we've been, although 2016 and 15 were further apart. The problem is we did drift from the state in this last year. And to answer the question that's come up a couple times, we are absolutely evaluating that and seeing, OK, why? And for me, the fact that we had the third grade struggle in ELA and the third grade struggle in math is a significant issue that we need to evaluate. And that's what these folks are doing. They're all nodding their head like, yeah. <laughs> and if we were going to, I would say, if we were to go around and ask each individual principal why, they would give you ad nauseum answer as to why. They know. And that's where it needs to be known. But fourth grade. We actually closed the gap a little bit on the state, didn't quite get to where we want to be, but we closed the gap. Fifth grade, looking a little better, as, as close as it's been over the years. Sixth grade, also good, closed the gap very nicely this last year. Seventh grade, although it doesn't look like it, we did close the gap there as well. Not quite as drastically as you'd like, but it is closer, we did make gains. Eighth grade, also, closer again. Algebra 1, Algebra 1 is like English 2, it was invalidated in 2017, but we are as close as we've ever been in Algebra 1. 
Algebra 2 is, is a bit of a funky one because Algebra 2 is only the kids who took Algebra as ninth graders, so it's a very small sample size. And so you're going to see wide variability there depending on which kids are in that group. Um, and so I, I say all that to say when we see changes there, a lot of times it is just because of a different group coming through because the sample size is low. But we did get away from the, the state a little bit there. Obviously, we'd like to be much more like we were in 2017. And in my mind, if we were there in 2017, we could be there every year. And so district math as a whole, I'm going to tell you that we, this is a celebration for us because we have seen, and if this graph was to be pushed back further, we've seen a precipitous drop over the years in math. And, and that's been stressful. We have put a lot of things in place for math. We have emphasized math instruction and a huge shift in math instruction over the last few years. And we are seeing the fruits of that this year, this past group. We made eight points of gain, and the state dropped by 0.4. The state went down and we went up. I think that's a huge celebration. And I think y'all should be proud of what went on last year with this group. And obviously, we need to continue to close that gap. Our goal, obviously, is to keep that moving. And we'd like to keep going in that same direction. Now, I will point out that we are going to continue to, to have this huge emphasis in math because the gap in math is generally larger than it has been in ELA, and it still is. And it should be small. And we have a lot of work to do in math. And so the goals for math, the first one is the same as what it was for ELA. Work on curriculum, guaranteed Bible, all that sort of thing. The second one has been the biggest thing we've done over the last couple of years, and that is to, to, to continue to expand our professional development with Greg Tang. Greg Tang has provided very specific professional development for us and changing how we look at math, math instruction. Y'all have heard of the new math, right? I'm, I'm here to say the new math is not new, uh, but it is certainly a different way of looking at it because it's causing our students to have to think about what's going on with math. It's not just a, this rote process. You know, I, I walk through this particular series of steps and I arrive at the answer and I memorize that series of steps and I apply that series of steps whenever I see this particular <coughs> That's what we grew up doing math. What we're trying to teach our kids now is to understand what's going on with those numbers. And so we hear a lot of, when I was in a classroom the other day, the teacher must have said, imagine 50 times because we want the kids to think about what that is. So imagine the number 10 as an example. So I'll, I'll tell you guys. When I say imagine the number 10, what do you think of? Do you think of one zero? How many of you are thinking of 10 of something? 10 on dice. 10 apples. $10. I gave $10. <laughs> <laughs> she may regret it. Later. It's for the kids. It's for the kids. <laughs> Going straight there. Um, and so that's part of what we do, is, is that whole imagine. Imagine what this is. Not just write out this process. And so that's a huge shift, because our teachers did not learn that way. We did not learn that way. Our parents, the teachers, or the students did not learn that way. And so there is a bit of a tension trying to get that shift down. But I do believe that we have crested the precipice of this. Our teachers are buying in. Our principals are definitely buying in. The feedback we get from Greg Tang's uh, PD is just fantastic. We see it all the time now. <coughs> Maryland, we're around in classrooms, right? We're seeing it all the time. Let me ask, let me ask you this. So we're, Greg Tang, that's one of the strategies we're using to help us increase our math score. Yes. Are some districts that have scores that are above these state averages, are they using Greg Tang? And is that helping yeah. them to have the higher score? It's actually, uh, I, I think Blues and Friends is probably the first in our area. They've, been, they've had Greg Tang around for 10, 12 years. Um, yeah, and they're killing it. The Greg Tang is through our PDN, which is you know through our area consortium. Uh, we're all paying into the consortium. We, we pay for Greg Tang to come for a whole lot of districts, and then we get him separately for us. Um, I, I would say that the number of districts that are not using Greg Tang would be a, you know, the number you want to look at would be the easier number to count. Most districts are doing something with him in some form or fashion. How many? So, so yeah, are we, are we getting, 
this is not, it's not the entire wagon, obviously, but we do believe that this will help. Now, the thing is, with this particular strategy, is you have to be patient. It's not going to change immediately. If we're looking for immediate changes, this ain't it. But over the years, it's going to have lasting changes. And so those students that have had these strategies from kindergarten, to first grade, to second grade, they have this method of thinking that is much better for the long run. But it takes years to see the fruit of that. We are starting to see the fruit of that. Hey Brian, how, how long have we been doing Greg Tang now? How many years? This is really our, our third year, and the first year was not complete. Okay. We are in the full swing of it now. And if you go around and talk to teachers, any teacher in elementary, they can give you a dissertation about what's going on in their classroom with Greg Tang. The, uh, the, these scores are the mean, right? The average of yes. the data points, is uh, that what they are? Uh, you can use mean as a loose uh, description. It's an average. MPI, which is in essence telling us what the average score is. Yes. Okay, it's the average score, so there's a, dis there's a, a dispersion around the mean. Sure there is. So the dispersion around the mean and the math scores would be right above that one level, then there's a considerable number of students that are below it and a considerable number of students that are above it, yes. which averages to that data point that's close to, if I remember my stats class yes. the right way. So, so the, the, the kids that are below it, we've got great, we, we're, we're pressing, we're, we're working hard, strategies. Now you got the kids that are a little bit above it, and then you got kids that are up here that are taking that, actually pulling that mean up considerably, yes. I might add. And so, I mean, the, the issue is not how we're going to solve this problem. The issue is how do you satisfy this opportunity that kids who might be able to move much quicker or in the same 27 kids, average kids of the class. How do you how do you speak to the parents about that? And so you set up a, a rather complex issue, and that is teaching every student. And, and and we absolutely want to teach every student where they're at and move them to where they can hopefully be. I understand that. And and that's different for each kid along the way. And so it is enticing to focus on one particular group. Focus on a student who is struggling, or focus on the student in the middle, or focus on students who are successful. We try to differentiate within the classroom as much as possible, and so we are providing opportunities for our high-performing students while also capturing the desperate needs of our low students. Uh, it, it looks a little different when you get higher up. Uh, when you get, to, you know, we have our challenge program uh, throughout elementary school for those for those students who are truly flying high. Uh, we diversify our class offerings. When we get into secondary. And it's those students, uh, actually one of the things that Dr. Markley and Dr. Shelton and I were talking about today, <coughs> our program allows for every student to go as far as they possibly can, as fast as they possibly can. So we have students that at the end of that whole road are going to MIT in a full ride scholarship. <coughs> That's, we, we offer the same program as any, any school in this city. There, there is nobody that's offering higher classes than and be able to get, take those kids to that point. So we should be very proud of that. But we're also concerned with those students that are struggling behind because it, it, in some ways, our high level students, we're trying to get them to their potential, which is great. For our students that are struggling, it's, it's life or death. Uh, you think about not having these basic skills and walking out into the world, especially when it's reading and writing, especially when it's reading, that's a gateway skill. I mean, there are just, you, your, your life is closed to, to aspects of, of what you potentially could do completely. But if, you, if we walk out here as a good reader, you can do pretty much anything, right? You can learn to do other stuff. You can know how to look something up on Google and, and whatever, and learn, you know, read a manual, uh, get in and, and, you know, people will deem you to be successful just because you can communicate well. So yeah, it, it is a struggle for us, and that differentiation is important all the way through. That, that's a huge challenge for these folks. All right, so number three on here. Dennis, uh, Dennis, I'm sorry. you raise your hand. This is, this is not typical at all, and I hope you don't mind. Do you mind if I say something? So, Go ahead. From the perspective of a teacher that really, I'm, I'm not a classroom teacher, I'm, a, I'm an art teacher, but in sitting in these um, meetings where I'm hearing all the teachers deal with the frustrations that they have about their students not being perceived properly the way that they want because they know that 
ins and outs and the struggles. Star testing is one that I think is really great at showing an individual student you can see where how their reading scores go up or how their math scores go up. And to me, that's the more meaningful data. And when you look at this, and the test is a moving target itself. The, the student, when you're prior, prioritizing, prioritizing the actual student and their progress is much better than prioritizing the test and what, we're, what we think we're seeing with the test. So for me, um, focusing like the data teams, when we have all the teachers working to bring up all of the students and we can talk about the successes that they have, like, hey, this is the progress that they've shown. That to me is the more meaningful thing and the teachers are all focused on that. So it's always, it's concerning and it's frustrating to see all these things, but I think when you're focusing on the kids, that's what's more important and what's more valuable than when you're focusing on what is this test really showing us. And I think that that, that doesn't capture everything that we're doing for the kids. Mm -hmm. yeah, and sitting in on a data review team will give you everything you need to know. If you, if you ever really want to know what we're doing as a district, right. that's the place we'll see it. Good. Thank you. It's even beyond STAR. I mean, the data, data review teams use all sorts of data. All, all yeah. the way from, and STAR is very is fantastic, but even just perceptual data. Uh, when you're teaching a class, you can look on in the audience and know. I mean, as I'm, I'm even doing here, as, as I present, I'm watching you to get a perceptual idea about where are you? Are you with me? Are you not with me? Are you, you know, that sort of thing. You can do that. And our teachers are experts at it. And so they walk into the data review team, they're able to talk about how are these kids doing in this specific area today? This specific skill we're trying to teach today. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, mm -hmm. that is an absolute great uh, tool for us. Yes, sir. I'm glad he said that because I'm struggling with a number mm -hmm. that means nothing. Mm -hmm. um, what um, I I like I know I think you can do it. I've done. We can bring up this report and compare it to our surrounding districts, right? No, uh, we can calculate for our surrounding districts, and not, not these particular graphs. Uh, what, I, what we can do, though, is calculate MPI and compare MPI with surrounding districts. Yes. Because from a competitive standpoint, um, it's perception, um, these, these numbers. And I think when somebody just looks at a number and they think, oh, this 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 district's better than that district, but this and that 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 comes into a lot of decision making that families make based on these numbers. Yeah. And so I think the way we present this should be yeah. done from a competitive advantage. So so there's good and bad to that. Um, one is I do agree with you is that. Uh, numbers tend to make simple and very complex. And, and this one number, 311 for District Alibur 2, is an oversimplification of where our students are at in that moment. But as a, as a society, we do tend to want to compare, to boil down to the most simplistic form so that I can compare one against another. The reason I say it's an oversimplistic um, evaluation is because there are a myriad of factors that go into the 311. And, and as a principal, and I know these principals have the same discussion, I would get parents that would come in and, and ask and say, I'm, I'm looking at coming to this school. That was a great time I did. I'm looking at coming to the school. My kids are at O'Hare. Um, I want my kids are saying they want to come to this school, or my kids have been homeschooled, my kids are saying they want to come here. Why should I let them come here? Because I see that the test scores are not where they should be. That conversation is great to have in person because you can explain exactly what I've been doing here. Your child is going to have a fantastic experience here. Let me show you the building, let me show you the classrooms that they're going to be in, let me show you the curriculum, let me show you the career education planning guide, and show that you can take the upper level courses, we will take you as far as you want to be. I walk around Raytown High and we had banners, still have, still do, of all the schools that our students went to, all the universities, all over the country, they line all the halls. And to show that we have students sign you know, I went to MIT, sign that, sign that banner. UCM, UMKC, Harvard, whatever. Because the numbers do not do justice to what actually is going on. And, and you're right, we can show comparative numbers. But I'll also tell you that... I'm not saying, I wasn't saying that. I know you're not. Okay. And the reason that we don't, and because we do want to have a standard. The state average shows us a great standard to measure off of. Off of. We could also have these same graphs I could have every district along with it. We could have done that. One, it would be overcomplicated. 
and it would be a lot of extraneous data. But it's going to follow the measure, the predictable measures you think it would follow. Students that have have low freight reduced lunch, in other words, they have high income families, and have low transiency, have high test scores. As transiency increases and as income decreases, scores go down. That's just two factors. There are a whole lot of extraneous factors that go into being where you're at. And the reason why I don't bring that up here is because I, I don't want to, us to ever feel like we're excuse making. Because we're not. We love every one of our kids. And they all bring themselves with them to school. We teach all of them. And so we don't want to get into the whole game of we're at where we're at because we have a bunch of poor kids. That's putting our district on the backs of students who don't need to be carrying us, if that makes sense. Well, we so, all understand that, Brian, and we all agree with that. The problem is the discussion you're talking about mostly does not happen in person. It happens on Facebook, Do we agree? where you can't have an intelligent debate. Intelligent debates do not happen on Facebook, but unfortunately that's where they happen. And to address Alonzo's concern, which is all of our concern, is how do we overcome that and get more of these discussions to happen in person? Think about what this lady puts on, on Facebook all the time. Think about the, the presentation we had earlier today. Think about all the positives that we can put out there for our district. That's what we do. We champion the amazing things that are going on here every single day. Because we do have amazing things. And a lot of it is about marketing, isn't it? We, we need to market the good things that are out there. Now, if, if we get into the whole, what I just talked about, that is always perceived as excuse making. So what we do is we champion the great things that are going on here. We talked about the graduates that Brian has, you know, going out there to work and getting a good wage, you know? We champion that stuff, and we should continue to champion that stuff. And so at every opportunity you have, and I know some of you are on Facebook, okay. um, champion those things so that folks can see the great things that are going on. You know, great town unleashed. <laughs> I guess what I'm, I'm saying is, I know we have to pay attention to this because we're held to a standard. Yep. Um, but even in our own present, this is us. It is. And so, I think that could be presented in a way that doesn't show us lacking. In, even now. I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, and, and part of it, and I, I said it earlier, part of it is I do want to try to present in such a way that we don't have an overwhelming amount of information as well, honestly. And, and the state is a good standard for us to look at. And it doesn't, as we go through the presentation, the state standard is not necessarily putting us in great light. We're below it all the way across the board. But it is reality. It's where we're at. And you said it very nicely there. The reason we talk about this data is because that's how we're held accountable. So it is important for us. I guess maybe we should have a meeting where we talk about. <laughs> I love it. How we and, and and actually that's a great point. If, if you want to go deeper into it, and I yeah. was kind of joking at the beginning, we could spend hours, <laughs> days, going over it. I mean, truthfully, and we don't mind. <laughs> so I don't either. Yeah. Well, let's do that. We'll plan plan that. Days. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Three. <laughs> <laughs> so, we still are through this presentation. You know, we're turning into ours here pretty quick. Um, and so, okay, so I went over the first uh, several of these. Uh, I should point out that uh, this last one, uh, we talked a lot about tier one instruction, whole group tier one instruction. Uh, tier one instruction is in the greater masses, the 80% of kids in, in, the, in the classrooms. A lot of what we're doing is trying to make sure that we're improving what we're doing to tier one whole group instruction. Uh, continue with math, uh, vertical team discussions. That vertical team is the second grade talking to the third grade to the fourth grade to the fifth grade, make sure that we have this continuity of program all the way through. We want to be consistent. We want to incorporate opportunities for math talk. That's talking about the thinking that's going on behind the math. And so getting students to talk about, okay, yes, this is how you, this is the answer to the problem, but now talk about how you got there. Or even before you get there, talk about how you're going to get there. Uh, we, we have substantially different kinds of problems now than we used to. 
where it used to be, the example I've been showing folks would be, um, here, are, here are, uh, is a rectangle, side three and side two. What's the perimeter of this rectangle? What is the area of this rectangle? That question is now substantially different, where it does take a lot of thought, not just a simple algorithm to solve. Sorry, I didn't. <laughs> and so um, I'm looking over at Maryland because I can't remember the exact problem. Give me an example of that problem in the advanced format. Where they have to minimize or maximize yes. the area yes. with a fixed perimeter, <coughs> or yes. a fixed area and Either maximize one. the perimeter. So Give there's some variations of that. Yeah. So they, they're building a pen to hold dogs up against the house, and they've got got their dimensions, it could be 36 feet of fencing, what would be the largest area you could make with that fencing that would hold the most dogs? So it's not a straightforward answer. <laughs> but that is using the same skills. Six by six is a square. <laughs> and that's like a fourth grade example, isn't it? It is fourth grade. So let's move on. <laughs> that's what we're trying to get. We want to make our students think or sound as a. All right, just like ELA, we have math specialists at the elementary school leveraging them to scaffold our kids who are struggling and give them the skills they need. We do high school and middle school tutoring after school for math. We want to continue that. Uh, again, classroom visits, the interview teams, and July summer learning camp. All right, science. Last year was a field test. This year, first year of the new uh, test with the uh, uh, next generation science standards. But you're going to see a substantial difference between 2019 and 2017. Different tests, different standards, all that sort of thing. Uh, fifth grade science, we closed the gap very nicely. We were closer to the state than we've been all the way through. Eighth grade science, about the same as we did in 2017, a little bit further apart. And then biology, a little bit further apart again. We had a pretty darn good year in 2017. But overall in science, we're actually closer to the state than we have been. And so we're actually in a pretty good spot with science. Moving in the right direction, looking pretty good. And as far as those goals, again, the first one is the same, the curriculum goal. The second one is standardizing common assessments, robust, multifaceted online assessments. Continued revision of common formative assessments at high schools, increasing part of meeting collaboration at middle schools, colleague are refining science proficiency scales. We're actually doing proficiency scales for all areas slowly. And in essence what that is, is it's a rubric for scoring if a student understands the material for a certain standard. It's a much more complex way than giving them A, B, C, or D. Okay. Streamlining and refining content for students in multi-grade level settings, specific job embedded professional learning. In classroom visits and data teams still. And government's easy to go through. Uh, we had field tests this last year, so we had no data. Uh, but we will again this year. And obviously, government is the only test of the bunch where it's a single grade. It's only 11th graders. All right. So these are the uh, college and career readiness standards. And there is no state comparison to these. We don't have state level data that gives us an average. And this first one is the ACT, Compass, AccuPlace, or ASVAB, Work Keys. Our students can take any of these tests to get a proper score, and it's the percent that are at or above the benchmark for that particular test. Now, we see this a little bit of a drift down this past year, but also keep in mind that that's the first year that the students did not, were not required to take the ACT. So remember we had the junior statewide testing of ACT? That's the first group that didn't do it. Um, and we only did it for like, what, two years? So at any rate, there's a little bit of drift because of that, uh, but we also have super test day where all the students take a test. So when we did that, all the students had two tests, and that was just helpful. So I, we, we are generally about the same as we were the year prior. And that's for juniors in high school that are taking that? Um, that, that is, they, they could take it their junior, they could take their sophomore year. Okay. Uh, but this is for seniors, this is these are only graduating seniors. Okay. So, this is the class of 2019. Shouldn't the number go up if everybody's not taking it? Okay, so there's two different things there. Average ACT, yes, that goes up. But this is not scored like that. Okay. Uh, this is, you get a certain score for, okay, so if a student gets a 21, we get 0.75 points. 
the square root of 2 gets you 25, you get one point for that kid. It's a rather complicated scoring method uh, for how this score is calculated. <coughs> You get a better score for students taking more than one test, generally. Mm -hmm. So, so we had a lot of students who just took the one test. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, it's if the state. Okay, well, there's a few other things. The state <coughs> grades these weird. In some ways. Uh, students are earning a pro, uh, qualifying score on dual credit and AP uh, advanced placement, Project Lead the Way, which is PLTW, and IRC, which is an industry recognized credential, which is the Herndon kind of stuff. And we actually went up a nice little month, and that's the point there. Uh, so that was a good year for us, going in the right direction. More students taking those advanced courses. It's very good for us. What's a, what's a qualifying score on Project Lead the Way? A three or better on their test. So they take an end-of-course exam, and they have to get a certain score. I believe it's a three. They have to get on that test. Well, what course would they actually take that in? Anybody knows? Um, introduction to engineering design, um, the principles of engineering, um, digital electronics. We had a, a whole slew of them. So any of those, of course. Any of them, yes. Getting a qualifying score in that. And so, but as a senior, if you look, each individual kid can only get, again, points for one of these. And so you can get a B in a dual credit course, or you can get a three on an AP test, or three on a PLTW. The IRC, I don't think there's any standard score, there was Cheryl. Uh, the IRC is not a standard qualifying score, is there? It's based on each test. Mm -hmm. yeah. In each program area. Yeah. yeah, this is different across the board. But a kid can only get points in one of those areas. So they may get a great score in dual credit and AP and PLTW, but we still only get counted once. Mm -hmm. Or multiple dual credit. Anything. So. Well, I don't understand what you just said. I know. Neither do I. <laughs> The, the general, we just we, this shows we have more students taking the upper level courses. It's the best way to look at it. Okay, but so if a kid's taking a dual credit in calculus, yes, and also taking project lead the way, yes, you're saying a score only counts from one of those. We only get to count the kid. So did the kid get a qualifying score? If the kid gets five qualifying scores, it's still just one kid. So 35.8% of our kids have qualifying scores in these areas. It's actually 36. I updated the graph, but yes. Okay. That's how many, which went up from 34.9 the year prior. So that's good news. That's 35% of all of our kids. All the graduating seniors. But I bet if we had the percentage of kids that are in those courses, it's higher. You'd probably be at 90 or 95%, I would think, because that's why they're in those courses. Oh, of, of the kids who were in that course that got a qualifying score? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be. But this is all students, all the graduating, all the graduating seniors of 2019. 36% of them got a qualifying score. And we do obviously want to just keep moving that, that, that number up. We want more kids. This gets back to Mr. Toady's question about what we're doing for advanced kids. This is one of the fruits of that labor. Okay, place in college or career. This is the percent of students that are, once they leave us, we do a follow-up visit, call, troll them on Facebook, whatever we need to do, <laughs> to see what they're doing. And are they doing something that matches where they should be going? Uh, so if they're living in mom's basement or working at the gas station, they don't count. Uh, but if they're at college, good. Uh, if they're in a job that matches uh, a career path that they had with us, Good. If they're in the military, good. So we're doing good there. Moving kids in the right direction. They leave us, 84.7% of them are doing something good the year following. Mm -hmm. Like that. So is that individual contacting those kids? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's Cheryl and her team. Yeah. Okay. It is. I have her team. <laughs> And actually, and, and it's actually a whole lot of folks that are in here yeah. you know, the, at the high schools or whatever. It, it's it's a coordinated by Cheryl and her group, but it is a large effort. It is, it is very difficult to find a lot of our individuals um, in order to get the, the information that we have to have to be able to do this report. And the other part of it is sometimes the response that we get is that I'm no longer a K-12 student, I don't have to tell you this information. Yeah, and so that makes it really difficult because we don't have anything to hold over their head. Um, because 
they don't have to tell us. Um, we try lots of other ways to find out, but um, there, there are a lot of complicating factors to how to get this number. So we do actually get the clearinghouse, the NCAA clearinghouse, we get a lot of data from there. Uh, the state card comes up with the clearinghouse and we get some good data from that. So if the students are in a, like going to the zoo, um, that participates, we can get that data fairly easily. It's getting that 10%, 20% that are out there. That takes a ton of time. So yeah. this number is maybe higher, not lower? Could be higher. Yeah, well it's, it's certainly higher than what it is because of those yeah. students just can't contact it. It's not but like, you know, there is no assumptions to be made. It always no, higher. Yeah, it's higher. We just are. Okay. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's definitely that, at least that. But, I, but I, we've gotten a little pretty close. And why is there no comparison? Say that? Why is there no state comparison? Oh, the state just doesn't give us that number. No. So I get the number off the other ones, but I, I, I can't find this state number. It's not easily accessible mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Or else I put it up there. Sure. The, um, the kids that go to Herndon but are in other districts, their numbers count for their district, not for our district. Is that correct? correct. Okay. So Summit Tech, for example, will send us follow-up on students that went to Summit Tech but are rich on students, and that goes configured in our large February file. And do we only have to figure that for one year post? What? Okay. Currently. Oh. Yeah, I was going to say, M76 is going to push us out yeah. two years, which just makes it twice as complicated. Brian, it's five. Oh, heaven's <laughs> sake. <laughs> it just gets worse. So, anyway, that would be a complicated number to get. The state likes to depend on that clearinghouse as being the, the all catch all for us. So, this is like the most important. All right, district attendance. This is that 90 by 90. And not new information. You get the attendance report every month. And this reflects uh, where we were at with attendance last year. Uh, graduation rate, we're seeing a nice little steady increase on that. Uh, we had a little dip last year, we had a nice little increase this past year. 90% of our kids, this is a five year cohort, which means that within a year after they should have graduated, they had graduated. And we work hard chasing after these kids to get them graduate, even if it's a year late or two years late or three years late. We keep chasing them. Uh, that's a nice title of the slide, conclusion. <laughs> um, so first off, we should be proud of what we've been doing in math and college and career readiness. Those are really great numbers for us. They aren't where we want them to be, but we should be proud of the direction we've gone. The instructional changes in math are working. We need to continue down that path, do a better job of it, even better year. Uh, we need to continue improving reading across all grade levels. And in particular, reading and writing opportunities for all students in all curricular areas. And so get our kids reading and writing more often across the board. Uh, we need to lean on the strengths of our DRT process. It is a huge pivot point for us. As you mentioned, this is where the discussions are happening. And we have a, a big measure coming up with uh, MOAP, that's a Missouri uh, assessment program that is with the state through MASA. Um, we're going to pilot NWEA, which is an, an assessment platform much like STAR. And I think Alonzo had mentioned how this feels kind of like, you know, what is this for? It's, a, it's because the state, you know, measures us on this and holds us accountable. One of the problems with math and EOC is we don't get the, t the test results until months after they take the test. It really, honestly, has no instructional value at all because the, the teachers in these buildings can't take the map assessment results and make instructional changes based on those map instructional results because it's so delayed. NWEA gives us results now, detailed results. So that teacher can make instructional changes, modifications based on that test that the kid took that morning. They can walk into a, a data review team and make instructional changes on it, which is why you mentioned that we use STAR more often than anything because we get that immediate feedback. And so we're pushing as part of MOAP to have this alternative testing method in place of MAP or EOC. And so we appreciate the support of the board in going that direction. And we're going to start uh, piloting that actually in, in uh, December, January. So we're going to go do that with about 600 kids this year. Any other questions? 
It's a lot. It's a lot to digest. And I truly want to thank the board and everybody out here for the amount of work that it takes to get us moving in the direction we've been moving. And we really are moving in the right direction. So, all right. Thank you. Brian? Just a couple questions. First of all, great job by this group up here asking some questions. But things that, uh, that struck me, the comments by a couple of you. Uh, one, first of all, you see that, you saw that target and uh, you saw approaching and floor. That's MSIP 5. We don't even know what it's going to be in MSIP 6. They haven't created a rubric for MSIP 6. Yet they've created the standards, they've created everything. They, they don't have a rubric out. Uh, so that should tell you something right there that we need to be somewhat concerned about. But uh, something that uh, Mr. Burton and Mr. Toady commented about, one, Mr. Toady talked about, what do we do for these, there's these kids that are up here. You know, we know there's these kids here, but there's these kids up here. And then uh, you kind of said something along those lines, Mr. Burton. What are we doing, what are we doing about promoting those kids that are, or promoting the good things that are going on? And, and I just wanted to, there's some people out here in the crowd and I, I'm a parent that's, uh, that's a recipient of some of those good things that we should be talking about. I've got a, a, a sophomore over there right now uh, who already has, well, before he became a freshman, he had four, five high school credits. And he's sitting as a sophomore taking enriched algebra two. Uh, and that would have happened, I don't see Lori here, but I see Dr. Sades back there, about what's going on with, and with uh, Dr. Bruton. And, and, you know, I have a freshman that's going to be in the same boat, and they're going to be taking. Which is Missouri. And so you walk in. I thought, that's one of the things. My vision isn't as good. As it is. It's going to get better. I hope. But, um, but then I'm also going to have, uh, you know, two, uh, two high schoolers that are going to be taking college chemistry before they get out of high school. So, those are the good things we need to be promoting. They're going to do well on their ACT, better probably than most. So. And that's what we do. We do have those things we're offering our kids. Uh, we just need to get more of them, leading them to water to drink. So, anyway, I want to say that. Okay. Um, Dr. Huff did speak a little bit to 8.13. The last on the item is 8.14 at South Island Auditorium. Uh, just an update, we have Sandy here. If the board has any questions for her, <coughs> she can answer those. We ask her to come uh, and address those. Well, I'm, I'm the one that started uh, the discussion that I'm about to start. Uh, and, and the issue, um, I'm, I'm not comfortable with it, but I want to make sure that the board understands why I put this on the agenda. Um, from time to time, I have um, I, I've absorbed the notion that we, the improvement that we did to South High with the trust system, has um, it, one circle says it's 12 to 18 months that it will survive, and and, uh, and then I heard well it's actually three to five <coughs> years that it will survive, and I and I thought well how does a building uh, how does an improvement to a building not survive? How does it die? And uh, so um, last week, in, um, I was in Mexico last week, so I had, I was thinking clearly um, in Mexico, I must confess, with 90 degree weather, I apologize. But in any event, uh, so I, I started a dialogue with uh, Dr. Shelton, and I, and I still was, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I, I, uh, I, I mean, I, th we had some transmission issues probably between Mexico and the United States, uh, but uh, it, 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 I, have a, I have a letter here that um, speaks to one, uh, the, the engineer, one engineer's uh, assessment of the design. So that's where we are. Where, where, where I've con I asked Alonzo to get involved, and my concern was how strongly do we believe this trust system will work on South High Auditorium. That's the bottom line. What, I, what, I, what I've heard from Alonzo is that we, we, have, we had our engineering design approved by a reputable engineering firm. That's correct. We had, when the, when the construction was completed, we had the engineer come out and satisfy that party that it was built to those specs. That's correct. And we have the uh, local 
construct uh, the, the code people, the code gurus uh, from City Hall have come out and blessed the everything that's been done, and and so it's it does not per se have a useful life or a point of death uh, unless unless we have a wind that is uh, 65 to 90 miles an hour and even then we we should not be worried about that is that is that wind is the only thing that would cause a challenge to the integrity of that trust system one time I mean and so the time frames that, that you mentioned as far as yeah. 12 to 18 months right as well as the three to five yeah that shoring system is designed to have a timeline for a reason. It's temporary. And that I brought this up the last time we talked about this, is that the code writes that 12 to 18 months, an external support system like what is in place is designed to go in and basically remain unobserved. Should be fine, no problem. Mm -hmm. The time frame that we have given it to you, we've stretched it out for that reason to try to get to the next bond cycle. Now we've also looked to stretch that out by doing observations. Now, you you brought up the idea of a catastrophic type of event. Is it just going to fall over tomorrow if we don't have a wind event? You know, that likelihood is very low. Um, we've added additional supports that weren't originally designed to try to spread out the support of the wall. Okay, by itself, it's not supported. It could fall over. However, that shoring system is stabilizing it in place. But because it's an external, it's not a comprehensive support. It's not as if we poured concrete down the middle of those CMU blocks and added more steel from the inside to anchor it. We're anchoring it from the outside. So they're going to be weak points. Mm -hmm. Now, Alonzo's correct. With a wind event, it's, it's unclear. I mean, if we have a tornado tomorrow, I can't tell you that it's not going to fall down. I can't tell you that many of these buildings won't fall down. That's, that's no guarantee that I can give you. Now, the reason the code, like I said, is written the way that it is, is that it is intended to be un unobserved. And so we are observing and we are engineers going out every two weeks to look visually to see if there are any changes in the bolt connections to the wall, if there's any stress on the steel supports, if there's any movement to the concrete foundations in the, in the ground that we've poured in place. We've also put strain gauges on the inside and the outside of that wall to show microscopic movements. So if the wall flexes in different places in between the supports, we'll be able to read that. Mm -hmm. And so because we've put those measures in place, we can say with some confidence that if there is movement in the slightest bit within the time frame that we're watching it, we're going to know and we'll be able to warn you. And that's, at this point, short of replacing that wall, that's the, that's the best observation that we can offer. And that's, and we have engineers, multiple engineers backing and up that. What have you that, observed so far? No movement. So after you put a system like that in place, you're gonna see a little bit of movement because you're pushing on the wall. You're putting yeah. concrete in where you're penetrating it. You're adding steel, so you're pushing and pulling on it. But the support that we've put in, we have not seen any movement since we put it in place. I am now going to stop worrying about it. Thank you so much. So, Sandy, since you're here, we won't spend too much time on this, but I mean, the good news is it's given us some time to do something else. And the something else is what we talked about last week, moving to our lease and looking at some possible designs of a new project out there. Do you have anything to add? on the drawings or possibilities or not yet, or? Not yet. Um, we are starting to look at concept ideas so the, the ones that we put in front of you last last month um, we're going to start developing those probably closer to the end, uh, end of the year uh, we have some renovations that we're working on right now for Raytown High School for their auditorium so while we're working on those design upgrades and renovations for that space, we're also looking at how we can create some parity to possibly the new project for South High so that we can we can work those together. So that is is in the works, but we're we want a similar team to work on both schools. So that's why we're just we're waiting, but we have started. Great. All right. Good. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Dr. Marco? All right, technology committee meeting report. Who's giving the vote? Oh.
on me. I can get a small report if you want me to. Um, I was there for that night. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I said I'm on the board. Um, so we, we kind of discussed where we're at and um, what we're doing as far as um, moving forward. And uh, we, we talked a lot about the seniors and their um, uh, laptops um, and the percentage. We would like to get that percentage a little higher of the number of kids that come and take that. But um, there were, for first year, a decent amount that um, accepted that. Tyler, was that like 30, 30%? 40? Uh, I don't remember. We're a little over 50%. Well, see, look, I underscore it. Yeah, a little over 50%. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of some of the stuff we talked about. Do you want to is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Mr. President, I move the board approve the November 11, 2019 consent agenda as presented. Second. Mr. President, I'm just curious. I noticed the agenda is completely rearranged. Is there a specific reason for the rearrangement? Or has it just gotten out of the old way? Mostly because I wanted to put uh, some of Dr. Markley's highlights and the board reports at the beginning. Oh. So it's going to stay this way, or is it going to go back to the old way, or what? It's going to stay this way for right now. <coughs> Just basically move the consent agenda item down a little bit. Yeah, I just noticed that the, the, the differences. <coughs> Next item. motion to approve the 1920 board goals as presented. Say that again. Is there a motion to approve it? That won't prevent us from having discussions. Of well, addition. we should have a motion before we have discussion. Mr. President, I move to approve the 2019-2020 board goals as presented. Second. Yes, now we'll have a discussion. Thank you. I have one. Oh, did somebody say something? No, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. I like the way these are. I like them short. The only thing I would change in goal number one is to make it consistently each goal beginning with a verb. I'd like to change, take out the word continuous and just say improve in all areas of student achievement. So that each goal starts with a verb, like the second goal then starts with create, then strive, then assure, and um, I guess that's it. So what is your specific change that you're asking for? Strike the word continuous and write improve in all areas of student achievement. Is that acceptable to everyone? I think the word continuous does indicate that there has been progress, and so you're indicating continuous progress. Then Maybe. we should say improve continuously in all areas of student achievement. I like achievement. that better, yeah. Because we need to start with the verb. Or I like the word continuous. In the, it's in a good place. continuous improvement. Down here. Mm -hmm. 
Can't you strive? Well, we've created, we've strived, <laughs> we've <laughs> assured. <laughs> so, yeah, just to make it consistent. Well, let's agree on, on it and settle. <clears throat> I like improve continuously in all areas of student achievement. Is everyone okay with that? Yeah. Sounds weaker. I like the way that they're short and easy to read. Yeah, Mr. President, I'd like to offer another goal, please. Um, yeah, we add, add another goal? Yeah. All right. Is that right? Uh, the, uh, the goal is, uh, and I'll give this to uh, Rachel, to, uh, the goal is to investigate and analyze declining enrollment and develop strategies and build commitments to restore enrollment and retention to 2015 levels. Uh, the background on that is that uh, the, I, I saw your schedule last week. Uh, here, let me give this, pass that down. Uh, schedule last week um, that enrollment declined again this year. And I believe we're off 700 students from 2015. And the price tag on that's about $3 million in revenue, thereabouts. And, um, and it's, a, it's a constant curve. Um, and, you know, I. I um, Maybe this is unusual for public schools to be concerned about that, um, but uh, but I, I think I'm, I'm challenging that presumption. Um, it, you know, I, I think uh, things get done if people own the problem, and, um, and and I know we're all working hard. I know these teachers are working hard, but the but the strategies around uh, retaining people, retaining students, and um, and increasing enrollment probably is different than teaching a classroom. I mean, it deals with marketing issues, it deals with the public relations issues and the like. And, um, and, and I think we need to seize the moment when we've had that declining curve to try to reverse it. And it also goes into retention. What do we need to do to speak to the, the young people that might be entertaining a move uh, east and uh, is there an intervention kind of opportunity there for us to speak with them or their parents if we hear about that and think about that? Um, so top of mind, I think, is important. I think also the data uh, analysis, I think, is also important. Um, I looked at the enrollment report that I think you all received in 2016-2017 and performed by um, some um, analyst professional who signed an opinion on it, and in his cover sheet, he said, I thought the data was really interesting. He said that uh, in that year uh, preceding, uh, a thousand students came into the district, uh, and then at the end of the year, um, a thousand, those, a thousand student, those same thousand students did not enroll, and, um, but they did have addresses in, in the Raytown area. And I thought, well, wow, that's a, how does that happen? I'm sure there's 90 reasons for that, but you start looking at those kind of opportunities. Um, I don't know if we have a plan. I mean, I'm, that's, my, that's my concern and a, and a commitment. I know we have commitment from these folks to, to do a, a great job teaching, but isn't there maybe um, a different skill that's needed to retain students to grow the enrollment, to, to preach the things that to preach the things that we do well. I mean that schedule of uh, ninety percent, uh, whatever it was, of the students are having a career in college, eighty four, ninety percent. That's a big number, and uh, and you know I think we've got to win kids back here. I think they have alternative. They have, they have the opportunity to do homeschool. They have the opportunity to move east, and um, and I'm I'd, I'd really like to see a commitment and a plan and see what we can do to, to, to bend that curve uh, back in our favor because it does mean money to us. It means money to the teachers. It means, it means that, that we don't have to go back to the taxpayer and maybe ask for money. So those are the kinds of things that are my, on my mind. 
and, and I'd be happy to serve on, some, on a team, I'm sure there are teachers that have to be serving a team, to look to think about professional approaches to that issue. And I don't know if it's done within the community, but I think we need to start doing something. That's my personal view. I personally think those are things that we should be doing too, but I'm not in favor of that, adding that on to this document as a board goal right now, but uh, let's see if anybody else is... Could it be, Mr. President, under number three, the goal strive to become the district of choice for the metropolitan area? Could that be one of the strategies under that goal? We can... Not just including staff? I... Well, include better, a bullet point that speak. says maintain, retain, <coughs> or maintain, increase student enrollment as a goal. I mean, at least maintain. We don't want to continue to see a decrease. Maintaining what we have and increasing on, on a year. Something that's the same as what we did for, uh, for staff. Um, and put it where? Number three. Number three. Number three can include both students and staff, and then we can add a bullet to address what do you re think retention. Is, what do you think? Excuse that? me. <coughs> do I? Work? Well, I I think what I'm what I'm what I'm striving for is clarity that we have a goal, and and that um, you know the. Um, uh, strive and create and those kind of words um, um, may not be as effective as, as analyzing and determining what a numerical goal will be in increasing uh, enrollment. And, I, and that's what I'm pushing for, some number. And, but, and I, don't, I don't think you can come up with a number without analyzing it and thinking about a plan, but a, a concrete number is what I'm looking for. Well, as far as the goals go, I mean, that making it a goal under number three, but what I was thinking that these things would become part of what we do and what we actually would make a plan for each one of these things. And so, and I do believe student enrollment is, is crucial for any of these goals, so I do think it should be on there. But I don't know that we have to put plan or we have to go to that detail level on this document. Um, but we we definitely need that. We we just like we need to be the district of choice for staff, certified staff. Mr. President, can you guys agree on some morning tonight, or do you want to carry it over again to next month? Let me add one thing before we go into that. Number three, um, the goal itself is to strive to become a better uh, district of choice for the metropolitan area, and then we've talked about retaining teachers and hiring qualified and all this other. Uh, as number four, it would be to uh, uh, maintain the present level of student enrollment. And increase. Or increase, yeah. But I don't uh, think that's what he's saying. He's saying analyze to determine. Well, he is, but then that becomes... That would be under that. That would be... That becomes the mechanism that does that just like attract and recruit and retain high quality and diverse staff, that's what we want to do, and then it's up to our HR department to, and others to come up. Now here's the, the mechanism, and here's the system that we're going to use to do that. If you, if you have to lay out that on every one of these, we're going to have a 10-page goal thing, in my opinion, and I'm kind of like Mr. Burton, we just need to say, this is what we want to do now. You guys figured out how you're going to do it. Let us know your steps you're going to do, and that's fine. Well, it's a compromise. The yep. compromise would be um, uh, Dr. Markley has his goals. Why don't we put in Dr. Markley's goals? Because he's the guy that's going to, he and his team, or would drive the bus to increase enrollment. And um, I think, I mean, I don't, we've got the broad picture here, but we don't have the specificity. Uh, that we're going to do something, and we're going to turn that around, and we're going to try. And I think it needs to be in some. In, in, but we've, you know, 
we, I think we're, we're agreeing with, with what you're saying, Rick, but we've also agreed in past meetings that we're not putting specifics in this document. So That's we fine. Can, we can it, put it in both places. I think bullet point number four here is, is fine. I think That's fine, but I, I also my point was that I think it needs to be written down in Dr. Markley's goals. And I don't know if the administration has a problem with that. I'd like to hear it. So there, there, maybe that's the solution. Some of the things that you we talk about, as far as you mentioned, the thousand that were gone, but they're still here. Yeah. Some of the things that we did were follow up with phone calls. Of, Why aren't you enrolling our school? But there's many more things that maybe we can do. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a big conversation, a bigger conversation right. of what's here uh, than. It's going to take a community to figure this out, I think. Yes. We're going to have to drive the bus, or we're going to have to figure out the community is going to have to tell us what direction the bus might need to go. Yeah. So, yeah, we can include. So, let's see, Rachel, do you have anything down that would be bullet point number four then, or who, anybody, do we have actual? Maintain and increase student enrollment. That's what I have. I don't know if that's correct. So, you would put it in both his goal and here. Okay, yeah. good. Well, yes, but we want to make we got to put it here to make sure it ends up there. Yeah. Well, I think it's increased student enrollment. She said maintain yeah. and increase. I, I think I'm going to increase it. Okay. <laughs> I want to go I'm that way, not that way. And I want to figure out how to do it. Well, we got to stop the bleeding first. What? We got to stop the bleeding. We got to stop. We got to bend the yeah. curve. Maintain. We got to bend yeah. the curve. Yeah. Are you so? Are you guys okay with the wording that she? Yes. She ran. Yes. Yes. Great. Okay, shall I amend my motion? Well, that's to what? <laughs> what you just said. <laughs> and <laughs> what we changed at the point number four. Let's there's four, any other, any other questions or comments first. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? What is number one going to be reading? Is it going to be reading improvement, improving continuously or continuous improvement? I don't know the hang up. Improve continuously. I don't like that way it's worded, and I know what you're saying about starting with curves and all of that, but I don't have an issue with just saying continuous improvement because it's more clear. It's clear. <clears throat> and I don't want to get hung up on one little word, though, but that's my thoughts. I, I just heard that I, it, it seemed like the majority me. wanted to improve continuously. What, what, what do you guys it's fine, I didn't think I'm it was weak. I didn't think that was a weaker statement. Uh, improve. I don't know. I don't like I'm it. Fine with it's, it. It is weak. <laughs> Maintain continuous improvement. Maintain continuous improvement. When do you know you've improved continuously? That's my question. How do you know? What does that mean? I mean I'm a numbers guy. What does that mean? Does that mean just one data point? Or I mean, what? what I'm trying to get the commitment and, specific, and a specific number here. Well, the, maybe the, reason, I, maybe the, reason, the reason why there's no number, when I've, I drafted this to, for yeah. just for consideration, but I kind of took the specifics and the numbers out because some of them were not, it wasn't measurable in the first place. We were, no. They were just numbers. How about okay. this word? And it was just an improvement. How about with well, this? Please, everybody, to just say continue to improve in all areas. That way it leaves it the way. Great. No, no. Perfect. You don't like that either? Yeah. No. That's, Why? that's a suggestion that we've already made the goal. We're continuing to improve. Why did you use the we word continuous from, <laughs> I don't. I guess I don't, I don't understand, understand the difference between the continuous and well, not really a difference. How about I don't care. <laughs> in all areas of it's continuous, it's got to be continuous. Maintain continuous improvement. Well, I want to get to the state standard, that's what I want. I, mean, I think that's the goal. That's the goal. And if we continuously improve and we're that's still a goal. little bit Maintain, higher, the okay. district. Or Maintain continuous improvement. Maintain continuous improvement. Are you guys okay with that? The, yeah, that's okay with that for you. We're above, yeah. We won't be on that. <clears throat> That's fine. Increase student achievement. I can tell you, when I start continuously achievement. Increase student achievement. That's been the goal That's the forever. Goal. Increase, student Increase student achievement. That's continuous improvement. That's good, yeah. In Increase student one achievement. So it's changed. So the number one will say increase student achievement. Yep. In all areas? In all areas. In all areas. 
this group looks really bored. <laughs> they want they gotta go to work in the morning. Well support us for very well. Mr. President, I didn't send that to the committee on the I should have sent it to them. I thought it would be a simple change. But increased student achievement, I think, is good for number one. Yes. Well, just that. I thought I heard you say increased in all student achievement areas. in all areas. In all areas. Yes. <laughs> that good. All right. What else? That's it. Okay, so who made the original motion? I did. I, shall I amend it? Move to approve as amended. I, uh, Mr. President, I move to approve the goals for 2019-2020 as amended. Is there a second? Second. second. Mm -hmm. All right, I got to get this out of here. final right here. Yeah. Right there. And the amendments that we just discussed. Where's the motion and second? Please vote. Thank you, Alonzo and Beth, for leading that the initial document together. You know, we did take a few, a little longer than than we have in past years, but I didn't want to just change today at the top of the form. So I appreciate all your input on that. Even though ROTC didn't get any time about. <laughs> Hopefully you'll get it. We took technology out. All right. Next item, legislative platform. The platform is just there for you to read um, and add to any comments. Please send those comments to me and we'll include them in December for the final uh, approval. Uh, I'll also be sending you the uh, Missouri Association of School Administrators legislative platform along with the cooperating school district so you can compare the two and any changes you want we'll add and discuss at the next meeting. Item motion to Masonry Wall. Mr. President, I move the board approve the change order for Masonry Wall repair of Blue Ridge Elementary in the amount of $78,008. Second. All right. Well, it's already discussed that earlier. Any other questions or comments on this? For building upgrades. Mr. President, I move that the Board of Education approve Excel constructors to complete the 2020 building upgrades at a cost of $2,176,000 plus a 10% contingency of $217,600 for a total potential cost of $2,393,600. It's a lot of commas. <laughs> Second. Any other questions or comments on this item? Mr. President, I move that the Board of Education approve Larison Construction to complete the Chitwood Stadium renovation at a cost of
Did I get that right? Nine hundred fifteen dollars forty-five cents, plus a ten percent contingency of one hundred seventy-one thousand three hundred ninety-one dollars for potential cost of one point eight million dollars and some change. <laughs> Second. All right, Mr. President. Was this where? Try to remember. Uh, been a long night. It, we had a six hundred thousand dollar bid that our bid exceeded six uh, the expected number by six hundred thousand. Is this where I saw that? Uh, six yes. six hundred is high, too high. But yes, it went well over the uh, amount. What was the number then? Remember? Uh, was more like three hundred thousand. Three hundred. Okay, yeah. three hundred. Not much. What what was behind all that? So this is a project that involved design by the people of the school and uh, we tried to put their requests within the package. Okay. Um, and then the other thing, um, the labor market costs uh, for construction is starting to rear its head. You have the airport going and so on. Uh, square footage prices have dramatically increased, um, I mean dramatically increased, and we're starting to see that effect too. But a lot of this one was we were trying to fit in the, the requests uh, as much as possible into a base bid, and we hoped we did that because we also always create alternates to give us some room, uh, but this one we just we put too much in with respect to the fact that square footage prices have dramatically increased. And we've actually even started hearing the excuse from the subcontractors not to bid the projects because they're already tied up on the airport. Like a steel contractor, for example, gave us that rationale. So when we if we approve this, we're approving that three hundred additional three hundred thousand. Is that what we're we doing? We did a uh, well the reason why you got the information today on yeah. this. Yeah, this was done in a timely fashion. The problem was that the bids came in too high. So we did, it's it's a rare occurrence, but we did what's called a best and final, yeah. where we go back to the contractors and say, try again. But help us come up with ways to reduce costs. So we got that information uh, Thursday about 4.30, you know, the day's over. But they came back with lower numbers, um, changes, to the project to lower those numbers. To give you an example, we were going to do a customized press box um, at Chitwood, but uh, a $50,000 savings would be putting a prefabricated press box like the one at South High okay. on Chitwood. So that was a $50,000 a $50, reduction. And so what we did, <clears throat> we accepted those from the companies that provided it and we reduced the overage to just, oh, and I'm sorry to use the term just, but compared to 300000 to 91000 okay. over budget. Okay, I got it. Over the original amount that we had from the bondage. Yes. And, and that's the all-in overage, meaning architect fees, uh, permitting, contingency. All of that's wrapped in the all, if you look at all-in number, we're 91,000 over. Thank you. So we have the list here, but tell us generally the things that won't be in there that we might want to know about or might be concerned about. <clears throat> well, the, the biggest one is the press box. That's the, the biggest noticeable di uh, difference. <coughs> we'll subs, uh, substitute out lockers. We had our preferred vendor, but the, but the contractor as a vendor for lockers that they can get a cheaper price on. Once they're in, no one's going to notice the difference. Um, I can't promise you that, but they won't be, you know, they won't be cheap. No you kid's going to pay, hey, well, I don't like this brand of lockers in this locker room. I, I would think that would be the case, <laughs> exactly. Um, anyway, a change in guardrail to a 4x4 four four steel welded uh, guardrail instead of the fancy cable guardrails around the press box. Um, Monitoring the HVAC at the press uh, press box, which is that's really for facility operations to know that Dr. Brood's staff didn't leave the AC on all winter long. But we'll go winterize the facility versus trust a control system. We will physically go check that out. 
Uh, we do that now. We literally shut the building down to the chagrin of many of the uh, staff there for winterization. Um, omitting lighting controls, fancy lighting controls, and, and using switches, you know, in the press box, for example. Um, <clears throat> omitting the uh, new ser uh, electrical service lines, so we're going to we're going to salvage the existing and, and attempt to put a new weather head on this. Now, on this one, I can't promise we can actually make that happen. That's our goal. If not, we'll have to use some. I don't know what a weather head is. Uh, would you be able to? Uh, Articulate that better than me, Sandy, please. <laughs> or Josh, even. Um, yeah, so it's um, it's an electrical connection point that you'll see on the exterior of the building. So that the reason Travis is saying that we may or may not be able to make that happen is that what's encompassed in that savings is being able to salvage the existing electrical panels that are in the press box right now. <laughs> and putting the lines underground, which was one of the goals. You know, As you mentioned, we pulled in the staff, the coaches, as part of Raytown and said, okay, how can we make this better for you? And one of those comments that came out of that was burying some of those electrical lines that go from the pole mm -hmm. to the press box. I did that for you, Mr. Moore. I'm not <laughs> yeah. concerned. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to get it now? Yeah. Uh, Possibly. I, and that's and that's what yeah. Travis is saying. I mean, we're also tied into that was updating some of the HVAC. So ventilation and heating and then air conditioning to a few of the spaces inside. The electrical... Um, requirements of part of that system may require us to still upgrade some electrical. But there's other options that we could possibly do the gas heat instead of electrical. But, you know, we were trying to clean up the outside of Chitwood from the high school side. And one of the reasons we went with electric over gas was that we wouldn't have to locate foods. So, it, this is a, it's very complicated to try to put costs on each individual piece because we had an overall goal. Um, the press box is a, is a good point to bring up. You know, we originally started with a prefab solution and changed to a customized kind of stick built so that the contractor would have more options to be able to bring in different subs to bring that cost down. The contractor we ended up talking to, Larison, was able to find a supplier of a prefab press box that was cheaper than building it from scratch. So, and the one at South is prefab? It was, yes. See, and that's, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. okay. And I like Definitely. this stuff to be nice and look the best, but it's a great press box and no one ever complains that, oh, this is a prefab press box. We don't like it. No, it's and, a good press box. And we're still going to strive to be east without to engineer some of this stuff in, like burying the lines. We're, we're really still going to try to make that happen. But, you know, this place was built by volunteers and there's no telling what we're going to find. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in all seriousness, on a project where you'll use contingency, you know, we don't know what, what was in this thing. So I do I do feel like we'll probably use some of the contingency on this facility. It's, it reminds me kind of like a Blue Ridge and it's older and um, those buildings are more susceptible to issues whenever we start to mm -hmm. pull down walls. You know, yeah. And then the last time, the no athletic equipment or last year. Yes. So, I, you know, my goal there is to, to beg Dr. Shelton to find a different fund for any athletic equipment that we might need. But that was not part of the, that was not the scope created by the Citizens Advisory Committee. That's something that was just a wish, tried, wish list thing. That that's wanted. something they tried to do. Okay. Any other questions on this? Education approve the purchase of facial recognition system with any vision at the cost of $249,125 plus two annual payments of $12,906.90 for the total cost of $274,938.80. Second. Second. 
Any questions, comments? We're excited about this opportunity to, to step in a very innovative way to improve the school safety for our staff and our students and the community. Uh, as Dr. Markham mentioned earlier, our grant writer uh, helped us and carry on a project that Travis started a year ago uh, in completing this grant, uh, successfully earned it. Uh, these funds are going to go out the door almost immediately. Uh, the responsibility on our end is obviously to implement the, the grant, but also to collect data. And one of the requirements for the, for the DOG grant is to collect some data that they want. I think they see this as uh, a very um, important next step, not only for our community, but probably for many school organizations in the country. I think it's great, and that's another thing, one of those things that we can publicize, that we've got a big grant to pay for this. It hardly costs the taxpayers anything. Mr. President, could, uh, do we get the money all in one check? Yes. The 250000 right. Yeah, so we'll... We so you will, can spend it. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it'll, it'll, it'll be the other way around. We'll spend the money, and then we'll ask for reimbursement. But they'll give it to us all Yes, in yes. yes. Uh, what kind of data will it be collecting? Uh, the same that's collected now. Um, easiest way to describe the system is we're, we're just using facial recognition to marry two existing systems. One, our camera system, which records uh, you and others on video, as well as our visitor management system known as Raptor, the one that gives you an ID and they give you a little badge and all that sort of thing. Um, so no new data collection whatsoever, just <laughs> putting those two systems together and the uh, screening will take place before the person walks in the building. And the reason for that is once someone gets in the building, we've given up a significant layer of security. And so this so begins the screening process before they come. So the, the data that we'll be collecting and reporting back is how many faces did we see? How many then could we not only see but then recognize? So you see my face, but then you see my face and you know that I'm Steve Shelton. So that's the second level of the data. And then the third level of data is you see my face, you see that Steve Shelton, and you see that I am suspended, uh, but I'm on but I'm on district property. As far as the Department of Justice is concerned, this is a research grant, and the reason why they require this data collection is for replication. So our goal is to put it in place, get it going, so that others may replicate it. So is that a that cost? Is there going to be any other type of cost associated with it, like next year or the year after? The, uh, just mentioned in the motion that uh, not this year, but this time next year, we'll spend twelve thousand nine hundred six dollars and ninety cents, and then a year from that point, we'll spend another twelve thousand. Uh, 906 so so, so that I, I read that part but I was just wanting to know that's after all that period is there any other costs associated with no man that's okay. all encompassing so the data that they'll be collecting is basically the same data that you're collecting now so how long do we store the data that we collect now um, do we have a what's the policy the security video data is stored for 30 days and then our Raptor system, it, that doesn't delete any of the data as far as the hits. Um, if somebody comes in and, and they appear on a registry, and they alert us on that data. So that's all stored within Raptor, and that's stored indefinitely. Yes, so this will follow that same. Any video footage will be kept at 30 days. Okay. No, and, and just also, Ms. Solberry, and I'm a, I think I, looking back, confused your question uh, with what data we will be giving to. Uh, based on this grant, everything we'll approach the Department of Justice will be aggregated. There will be no individual information about any person uh, in the data points collected uh, for the grant purposes. Uh, I miss what I thought was being asked of what data is being used to run this program, and that's video and our visitor management system. Well, uh, I was, my question has also to do with the fact that I heard uh, uh, some information to the fact that there is some opposition to the facial recognition that's out there, like invasion of privacy or something like that. I don't know if you, you probably, I'm sure you've probably heard about that too. And so I was concerned about that. I understand the benefits of it, but I was just curious about the fact that 
uh, that invasion of privacy part, I think that, uh, and then the storage of data, and you said the data on the facial recognition is indefinite storage. I think, did you say that, Melissa? Yes. But uh, we have policies on uh, data that we store or we will work within those policies. But no new additional information is collected that's not already collected now. So uh, regarding the question of invasion of privacy, we already capture you on video and keep that, and we already capture your demographic information when you come in to visit. Um, we used to do it on notebook, and now we're doing it on computer system. But we've always collected demographic information on people who come in. Okay. Do we post, like we post about uh, video camera as, as I uh, We will. Here. We so will. you will post that. Facial recognition. Yes, we will indeed. Uh, Smile, you have facial recognition. <laughs> well, and, and, and it, that's true. Just like when I created the signs that says right. Smile, I got on one of 500 uh -huh. now, almost 1,000 cameras. Um, my intent was, you know, to make you aware, but also to make you aware. Yeah. Um, you know, just like they did the gas pumps, you know, way you're on camera, uh, that's to make you aware you are. You're, we are observing your actions. So, uh, yes, we'll have the for the same one, reasons, one, to inform you but, uh, that it is happening, but also to remind you that it is happening. So please pay appropriately while you're here. I did find out last week that facial recognition and fingerprints are not considered private. Uh, yes, and but we have a closed records policy hmm. here, board policy, and all of our records will be maintained under that closed records policy. In other words, the police call me and say, hey, can, you know, if they were say, can you give me fingerprints, you know, I, I'd have to have a satisfying reason to use this even information. So one more follow-up to Bobby's question. After two years, we make these other two payments, <coughs> what happens then? We just maintain and operate the system ourselves. Mm -hmm. Do we think it will be obsolete by then and we'll have to upgrade this much or is it expandable or upgradable or what? Well, the nice thing about this system, and let's <laughs> jump in too, but the beautiful thing about this system is it uses our existing camera system. Face First, the other system we piloted, requires us to buy cameras and install them. Uh, it, it was quite a mess. So as we upgrade our cameras, we just we just stick with that schedule and we'll uh, this is a software program, an algorithm type program, if you will, that's uh, being used among our existing programs, which is our Genetech interface for our camera system and our Raptor visitor management system. So, will it be obsolete? Probably this version, but that I, they'll upgrade us as, right. as needed. So, there will be an annual fee. So, if we choose to continue with it, there'll be an annual fee for software maintenance. <coughs> Uh, and some licensing costs or potentially if we want to expand but um, really as it is there will be a minimum um, ongoing cost after three years if we choose to continue but it will keep us current with the software. So one of the best things for me is the use of this at some of our activities where we don't but, have as much security so who will be like manning the system if you say you know. Okay. So say it's some of those things like football games. And stuff. Right, and that, that's its intended first phase. Uh, you, you remember we investigated a, a variety of things we do to improve safety and security at what we call open events. You know, the, the events either before or after school. Uh, so football game, basketball game, parent-teacher conferences, when just anybody kind of comes and goes, anybody can buy a ticket. They can be a sex offender. They can be somebody, you know, that's a violent felon that's been trespassed, etc. Yes, that's the first intended goal, is to secure those events because as we've talked about in here, with regard to safety, open events uh, have, a, have a lower safety threshold than schools from eight to three do when we're wanting to approve that. And I wish other schools would think about that too, but we are. So that's its first phase. We'll get this uh, implemented. The nice thing is, and I'm sorry if I'm rambling, but I can move the licenses around. So during the school day, the cameras that will be being used for facial recognition are one thing. And then after school at events, I move those licenses 
to let's say every camera at Chitwood Stadium. You know, I, I take them away from the schools because the schools are closed and it's not being needed. I move them over here and we'll monitor every camera at Chitwood. That's every what I'm camera. wondering is like you're having an event and we always have security at those. Yeah. But those those guys aren't looking at So what happens when, the when, when there's a hit? Yeah. It recognizes my face, it recognizes I'm a suspended student or I'm a sex offender or a felon. Uh, that information goes to every administrator on their phone and it, it's alerted. Um, and then those administrators know that Steve Shelton is in the stadium or on the campus and they go they go looking for him and there's a video of where I'm at and they can come find me. And and it, it does require human authentication, meaning if nothing's automated, like I get a beep and it says Bobby Salisbury is not supposed to be here. It requires a human to look at the picture and be like, that is Miss Salisbury or that is not. So no automated action will occur. So we'll get the alert and then we'll make a decision based on whether we determine it to be a match or not. If it's a match and they're trespassed or whatever. So nobody's probably going to be stopped at the ticket booth. It'll be something happens a little somewhat sometime later with a security guard probably. It, 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 it is possible if they get if they get they're identified like getting out of their car, mm -hmm. and right. and there's a and there's a and, and Brad Grace is sitting at the ticket booth and he's got it on his phone and here comes Steve Shelton and yeah that's Steve Shelton. Hey Steve, it's time to time to go someplace else. Okay. So it could be a trespassed individual. Um, oftentimes we've noticed at the ball games that. The, the trouble like fights and so on that occur are, are people that aren't supposed to be in there in the first place. They've been suspended, trespassed, expelled, whatever it may be. So those folks are on the list, just like they are in the Raptor system. So, you know, if you were trespassed from South High and you want to go to Blue Ridge, that's, that's going to pop up on the Raptor system. So one final question. Yes. So I'm an honest guy. I just want to go to my kids' uh, happy day. And I don't want my picture, I don't want a facial recognition when I get in the building or you tell me you can't come in. Um, we will collect your image it, regardless. It's it's our cameras, our video, we'll collect your image. Um, you do not have a choice when you come to a school. If you want to be in the building, you have to submit the required information through the Raptor system, which is your ID. And we do collect that information. And if, you, if you're not willing to submit that, you, you're not able to come. Let me make sure I understand. Let's say I don't want to have my picture taken and put a bag over my head. You're not going to let them in? No. That's okay. I'm just, I'm just trying to understand. <laughs> just trying to understand. I'm not going to do it, but I'm just thinking <laughs> there is a privacy I'm issue. Walk into something if you did. I mean, there is a privacy issue, and I understand that that's you know there may be consequences to someone yeah saying, i'm well, saying there's no new there's no new privacy uh information being taken we already video you we already collect your your id we're just using it a little bit differently now but right now mr Tody, if you go to south high tomorrow you're not getting past the office without submitting your id and you can't wear your Halloween mask either to, to, through the front door. That'll okay. get you a visit with the security. That'll get you too. I got a question for Melissa. So what if it, there's some problems needing to be repaired? I, you know, I know you guys do the repair work and on the computers and everything. So if this device breaks down or something like that, is that something that you all would handle, or do you have to send that out, or what? The beauty of this system over any other system that's been out there is one, it's accuracy, which is amazing, but it is just software that runs on servers. So okay. really all we're adding to our support okay. are two video servers that does all of the processing and a software that goes on top of that. And um, that additional cost of 12000 plus a year is to provide communication to their tech support, so they'll just remote in and fix anything. Okay, um, but that's only for two years on that 12000 That's for two years. So if we continue, or that's for the next three years. Three years. So if we continue past three years, we'll just have to continue to pay for that support. Okay. But they will they will fix anything, and they're local, which is great as well. They're in St. Louis, so they're just a couple hours drive away if we need them on site. So as far as a partnership with the company, it's been amazing, and I'm not worried about that load on our department for support. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to say... Um, there was a thread on Facebook a couple weeks ago, about 10 weeks ago, saying that we were going to use this in place of 
um, adding on the secure entrances. So I just wanted to clarify that these are we're still doing the secured entrances, oh, yeah, yeah. and this is being paid for with a grant, um, so not part of the bond money. I just wanted that out there. Thank you for clarifying. That is accurate. Yes. Two hundred fifty thousand of it is is paid for by the DOJ grant, right. and the remainder is by It'll come out of uh, the facility operations. Yeah. Budget. Yeah. So I'm glad we did that grant writer. That's already yeah. big, big payoff on doing on that. Any other questions or comments? Not everyone, go ahead and vote, please. Yeah, vote get out. Well, we're doing that. And before we adjourn, just let me. Uh, I forgot to read. We had several donations, and I wanted to read those quickly. I'll try to go through this. <coughs> An agenda. We had a donation of South Middle from Dollar General Literacy Foundation, $2,900, uh, to purchase Penn Pal School's <coughs> annual license. Donation of North Norfleet from River's Edge Fellowship for Watchdog Kickoff Party volunteers. Donation of Norfleet from Hope Network for Amazon gift cards. Donation to Norfleet from Ascension Luther Church uh, for Watchdog Kickoff Party volunteers. Donation to the Spring Valley from Lane Avenue Baptist Church towards. Uh, Scholastic Book Fair purchase, donation to Spring Valley uh, from Nikki Way for brown paper lunch bags, donation to Spring Valley from Susan Payne, donated clothing, donation to Herndon Career Center uh, from Tide Tool uh, for $1,092 cash for student, uh, student <coughs> fees, donation to South High from David and Michelle Bourne, the canopy tent and portable benches for boys track, donation to South High from West Family. Uh, pizza for girls volleyball, donation of South High from McCarthy Auto Group, team meals for football, donation of South High from Edward Jones, team meals for football. So again, like every time, we're so thankful for all those donations. They help a lot of kids, so great job there. Mr. President, yes. I'm with the Board adjourned. It's a regular meeting at 9.19 p.m. Second. Give it. Yeah, you too. Break the I did. No, it didn't show. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Oh, I get this. <laughs>